Discover the incredible potential of SEO and unlock the hidden treasure trove for your website. SEO or search engine optimization holds the key to skyrocketing your online presence by strategically weaving in relevant keywords throughout your website and securing high quality backlinks, you will capture the attention of search engines and soar up the ranking. But SEO isn't just about algorithms. It's about creating an exceptional user experience from lightning fast loading speeds to mobile friendly designs that captivate visitors. SEO enhances every aspect of your website. With rising technology and exponential rise of websites on internet, there exist huge demands of SEO professionals. Now talking about salary, an SEO professional at entry level can earn salary ranging between $45,000 to $90,000 per year. By gaining more experience, you can unlock higher salaries in this domain. So if you are looking to become an SEO professional, then look no further than Simply Learn's postgraduate program in digital marketing. Gain in-depth knowledge of search engine optimization. With this course, you will also learn content marketing, web analytics, keyword management and research, website optimization, and much more. Unlock a whole toolbox of skills, including SE ranking, Hootsuite, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Google Ads, and Keyword Planner. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Find the course link in the description for more information. Hear success stories from our satisfied learners in their own words. Change is inevitable, but growth is optional. For me, both came hand in hand. I successfully changed my career from software development to digital marketing and Simply Learn presented the perfect route. Hi, I'm Rimaz Rauf from Dubai and I have completed the PGP in digital marketing from Simply Learn with Purdue University. When I shifted to Dubai from Sri Lanka in 2015, I joined a group of company as a software engineer. But my interest in content creation attracted me towards the marketing industry. Intrigued by the marketing functions, I decided to take up a challenge that would change my life forever. I aimed for a career change. As risky as it was, the rewards were truly overwhelming. Even though the journey wasn't easy, the PGP in digital marketing with Purdue University acted as not only a catalyst, but a game changer for my career change. With no professional certification in marketing domain, it was difficult for me to transition and change my career towards completely. So I decided to upskill with a professional certification program. I chose Simply Learn because of its tremendously high weighting. To be rated as one of the best education portal online worldwide is surely promising. Not only were the ratings high, but also the courses were economically charged. The modules were very informative and amazing. I still refer to those. While in the final stage of my course, I told my superior about the certification program I was doing and then they offered me a digital marketing role in the marketing department as a digital marketing executive. This, that's how smooth it was. After working for a few years in the same company as a digital marketing executive, I switched to a new role as a digital marketing manager. With this, my skill upgraded, my salary increased, and my self-confidence boost alongside numerous other positive outcomes. I had a chance to take a challenge and change my career domain altogether, and I took it. So currently, I'm pursuing Masters of Masters program from Simply Learn, where I would complete eight Masters program, including artificial intelligence, cloud computing, and DevOps, and many more. Growing requires moving out of our comfort zones. Keep learning. What is search engine optimization? The practice of getting traffic organically through the search results with the help of search engine is called search engine optimization. Although being one of the most important components of digital marketing, SEO has had some myths floating. Is the popularity of your brand, product, or services among the audience, thereby increasing the chances of conversion of lead to customer. Traffic obtained organically is more consistent. Once you are aware of SEO strategies and start gaining visibility in search results, your site will gain constant traffic 
that will keep increasing with time. With SEO, one can reach a large audience to promote products and services. Businesses can acquire audiences from both the national and international levels. SEO builds trust among the audience. For instance, if your web page is available on Google search results, the audience finds it worthy of trust because of its online presence. Your competitors are doing it, then you should also do it. This could be a serious note. If your competitors are doing this to rank high and gain visibility, you must also do it or remain back in the race. Let's understand it with the help of an analogy. Susan started a business of handmade toys. She failed to gain enough customers using traditional marketing methods like newspaper advertisements and banners. So, she thought of putting the business online, thereby creating a website. The website was completely optimized for search engines and was soon visible on the search result pages. The website started acquiring the traffic which ultimately became her customers. The sales were boosted to an unexpected level and the revenue has increased exponentially. A good decision brought huge success to Susan's business. Susan was thrilled with joy when a thought struck across her mind. How were search engines able to find her website? So, search engines can be Google, Bing, Yandex, DuckDuckGo, etc which work on three basic steps that are crawling, indexing and ranking. First, we will understand crawling. Search engines are hungry for content and so they send the web spiders, also known as crawlers or robots or search engine bots to discover new content or any updated content. Content can be an image, web page, video, or anything else present on the web. This process is known as crawling. Soon after the discovery of content, web spiders start storing the URL of the content into the search index and this process is known as indexing. Once the content is indexed, it appears in the search results for the relevant searches. When a user enters a search query, the most relevant search results are taken from the index and displayed from most relevant to least relevant on the search result pages. This process is known as ranking. Search engine optimization is very, very complex. So when you're trying to understand it for the first time, I find it's very easy and best to just break it into general concepts that you already have some understanding of. So when I look at the hundreds of, con uh, hundreds of signals that go into SEO, I break all of them up into either relevancy and or, because sometimes it's both, popularity. So relevancy, popularity. Out of all these signals, they fit into one of these two things. Throughout the rest of this chapter in this course, we're going to break all the signals we have into these two areas so that you can rely on what you already know about the concept of relevancy and the concept of popularity to have some kind of anchor point for these new, brand, these new ideas. In this section, we're going to talk about the on-page factors, and I'll tell you right up front that these are going to become your favorite. These are the ones that you have the most impact on and that you can make a small tweak and have a gigantic impact on the amount of organic traffic that you send. Start with one of my favorites, title tags. Title tags are the single most important on-page metric that we have access to. This is text that we get to express, that we get to write, that shows the intent and the purpose of that page on the internet. This is really, really important because search engines use this, this text that we get to provide, in their search results directly. So we get to write what becomes the headline of the search result itself. This, uh, in addition to uh, the meta description, as we'll cover next, are the two factors that we have a whole lot of control over that influence both click-through rates and people's first impressions of our brand. Next up, we have meta descriptions. Now, meta descriptions are a little bit confusing because it is text that we get to provide to search engines, but more often than not, they override what we provide and try to choose something that is better in their opinion. Now, I go both ways with this. Sometimes it really is better. Most of the time, though, in my opinion, it's not. Um, but the important thing here is that we get to provide what would normally we'd have to pay for with ad copy. We get to provide it for free, customize it to however we want to entice, to entice clicks 
and the search engines are happy to promote that and show that in the search results. All right, now we're getting to the good nerdy stuff, the header tags. So this was something that was built into HTML when the web was first created. Uh, the idea here is that you're establishing a hierarchy. So you start with one H1, uh, saying what the main purpose of the page is, and you start to break it into subcategories. So you'll have multiple H2s below that, multiple H3s between all of that. Now, H1s used to be a very important and primary SEO metric that we got to use, but because it got abused, it now has less of an importance than it used to. So it shows what information is less or more important than other information on the page, but it is no longer the strongest indicator of what is the most important page on that. And right now, that's still title tags. Next up, we have URLs, Uniform Resource Locators. Now, these are the addresses of web documents online. Just like you have a street address for your house, on the internet, we have URLs for any given document anywhere. It could be PDFs, it could be images, it could be text, it could be your homepage. All of these have URLs. These are extremely important for SEO for a variety of reasons. The most important, though, is your keyword usage. You want to make sure that the words that you're trying to rank for are included in your URLs. The second part of this ties in directly to the first is you want to keep these short. So it's not okay to just put a whole lot of words you want to rank for in your URL. You need to remember that humans are the people, are the things that use the internet. They share URLs, they try to say them over the phone, they do all these different things where it becomes extremely important to keep these short and succinct so that people can easily share them and can type them in their browser without any issues. Now that we've talked about the importance of URLs, let's talk about URL structure. Let's dive in a little bit here. We'll start with domain names. So you've probably heard of this concept before. In the example with the URL I have here, example.com would be the domain name. So this is the first thing that people see with your online business. This is what's gonna mean all your advertisements, it's gonna mean all your marketing efforts. It's this name right here. I like to think of it in terms of an offline world. So if you're walking around, buildings typically look like something. So a barber shop almost always looks like a barber shop. A fast food restaurant almost always looks like a fast food restaurant. That same idea is gonna to apply to, to domain names. If you have a very spammy looking domain name or one that's hard to spell or one that's confusing, people are going to make an initial impression off of that. So make sure that you have something there that's gonna make a great first impression, It'd be something that's easy to spell. That one, especially in this new tech, uh, like tech craziness that we live in, people do a terrible job of that. But it's something that's easy to spell and something that's easy to pronounce and easy to share. So how is this important to SEO? Well, keywords are why it's important to SEO. This comes up all the time. It's important to have keywords in your domain name as long as you're not taking it too far. Now, this is one of those things I go back and forth with people all the time. How do you know if you've gone too far? Uh, I don't know. I mean, if it looks like you bought the domain name simply because it has the keywords in it that you needed, then you've probably gone too far. But is that the best way of measuring it? Can I take out my calculator and, and actually calculate that? No, you're just gonna have to use your gut. You're gonna have to look at it from a human, from a human perspective. So do not go overboard. Keep it as short as possible. Make sure it's something that you can easily share, something you're gonna be able to put on your business cards and be proud of, not something that you bought because you're doing it purely for SEO reasons and you think you're gonna succeed. Okay, so that is the domain name. Now what about everything after that? So in this case, it would be this blog post that I wrote. Well, that is called subdirectories. And you can actually have, um, in theory, unlimited subdirectories. <laughs> but from an SEO perspective, you do not wanna do that. And it's for all the reasons we've talked about before. If you have lots of subdirectories, it's gonna be confusing, it's gonna be hard to share, uh, it's gonna cause lots of problems in older browsers. So your best practice here is to keep as few subdirectories as possible. This will be good for both robots and for human beings. With the subdirectories as well as the files that come after them, you wanna make sure you include your keywords. So again, this is one of those weird things where there's not a, a quantified metric for it, but don't put the keywords in there too many times, but put them in there just as, as many times as you think is absolutely necessary. So generally this is once or maybe twice if it's already in the domain name. Okay, that's all the information I have right now on URLs. Feel free to uh, Google this subject if you, if you wanna know more about it because trust me, there's a whole lot of technical knowledge that goes in this, but if you're at this point, you already understand all the most important parts of it. As you likely realize, computers cannot see images the same way that humans can. Uh, they do not have eyes and they do not have the complex brains that we use to get meaning out of pictures, out of pixels. So because of that, we've had to come up with some other way of expressing the meaning behind images. Luckily, the creators of the internet were forward thinking and they provided us with a factor called image alt text. Alt text is the alternative text that is shown when an image can't load. This is done on purpose so that people who are blind are able to extract meaning from something when they can't see it. This worked out really well for search engines because, well, they're effectively, bl effectively blind and so that they can also use that information put into the image alt text to understand the meaning behind images. Internal links. So we have an entire section on links, but what I wanna cover at this point is just internal links. An internal link is a link that 
points from your website back to a different section of your own website. It is not pointing elsewhere, and it's not coming from elsewhere. It's from your website back to your own website. This is important from a, relevance, a relevancy perspective. You'll see internal links in your main navigation when you'll have one that likely says home, one that might say contact us, or one that says about. What you're showing to search engines and to humans is that this section that if you click on this link will be about our company, or this will be a place where you can find contact information for us. These links are not votes like external links, but they are relevancy metrics that are extremely helpful. When a search engine crawls and processes your website, it doesn't simply look for the instances of keywords. It's a lot more complex than that. It's using a technology called NLP, Natural Language Processing. What it's trying to do is it's using algorithms to try to understand the meaning of text the same way humans do when they listen to other people talk or read, read text. Instead of just looking for specific phrases or like the order of words, it tries to extract what's behind that, what is, what is trying to be expressed here, emotion, feeling, food, anything. So when a search engine goes to your website, it may seek keywords, but it's looking for context to that. You may say, just soccer, but just having the word soccer on your website isn't going to help you rank specifically for soccer. What you need to do, and what is more common and actually happens naturally, is that you'll happen to use words like goal and World Cup and referee. Google and the other search engines are going to take these into account and understand what, that you rank for soccer or that you're relevant for that kind of keyword by the usage of other synonyms and other common words that are used within the context of a bigger, broader idea. The next on-site signal that we have is sitemaps. Now, there's two kinds of sitemaps. There's the kind that are for humans, and there's the kinds that are for robots or crawlers or spiders. The ones that are for humans are called HTML sitemaps, and you've probably seen these before. They're generally in the footer of a website, click through it, and it shows you the major sections of a website and usually provides some search functionality. Those help you understand as a human what the hierarchy of a website is. How does everything fit together, and how do I get to, the, to something I'm looking for as, as quickly as possible? Those are called HTML sitemaps, and like I said, they're generally for humans. There's also something that exists on the back end called an XML sitemap. Now, this is something you can actually look at, but it's formatted for computers, so it's not going to be easy to read. An XML sitemap uses a format called XML, as you can probably imagine, to show the hierarchy and the priority of each of the URLs on your website uh, so that search engines can understand that and figure out how everything is interconnected. So at this point, we've covered a lot of things that are important and things that you should be doing and optimizing. Now, let's go the different direction and, and cover the things that you should not be doing. So these are the list of the most common mistakes that I see uh, that should not be done for a well-optimized page. The first one is keyword stuffing. So back in the day, it used to be helpful, and again, this is in the past, it's not true anymore. It used to be helpful to put lots of instances of the keyword that you were trying to rank for on the page. Search engines, and humans for that matter, are a lot smarter about this now than they used to be. Keyword stuffing does not work. You're not going to rank better for uh, any given phrase by including it 100, 100 times on the page. So this is something that doesn't work. You should not do it anymore. The next one is hidden text. Unfortunately, I still see this one all over the web. This is when you write content that is solely for search engines, it's not for people, uh, and you'll put it, say, white text on a white background. So a search engine can see this because they're a crawler, they're a machine, uh, but humans cannot because they cannot see the difference because there's no contrast. Now, that also used to work back in the day, but it does not, and, it, and that is not a useful thing to invest your time in today. Uh, search engines can tell when it's white text on a white background. That's actually very easy to tell from a, from a uh, computer science point of view. Uh, it's, uh, th there's other ways of trying to hide things, but when you hide text, s modern search engines are most certainly smart enough to be able to figure that out, probably better than humans, to be, to be honest. So don't bother trying to hide text just for search engines. They're going to figure it out, and it's going to work against you. The next one is repetitive anchor text. So we've all read these articles where you get to a page, and it just doesn't feel like it was written for people. You're reading a sentence, and it's redundant. It's got lots of links in it that really don't need to be links. It's it confuses the way the flow of, of the information on the page because you put links when they're really they're not necessary. This also used to be a tactic that used to work, but is no longer helpful. Search engines, the uh, natural language processing algorithms they used have advanced significantly, so they can tell when something is not readable, when something is probably intended for machines and not for people. So do not waste your time on redundant links and trying to, trying to sculpt your page rank or your, your link equity or the value of your links anyway like that, because just today's world, it does not work. The last thing that we have on here is cloaking. Cloaking is the idea of showing one thing to search engines and something entirely different to humans. 
Now, this is also, like everything else on the list, something that used to work. But as I've mentioned before, search engines, have, their algorithms have gotten much smarter and much more clever. And they can almost always figure out the difference between when you're doing this, if you're showing one thing to search engines and something else to humans. With, a, with only a few exceptions that I know of, which are in the process of going out, there's no reason to do this. So it is not something worth investing your time in. Now we've covered all the most important on-page optimization factors. Let's take a look at what the theoretical perfectly optimized page would look like on the internet. Now, there's a big asterisk here in that, well, no page would be perfectly optimized because the internet's dynamic and fluid and things change all the time. But if there was one, it would look very eerily, eerily similar to what we're about to talk about. Let's start with the basics. You need to have a title tag. The title tag needs to have optimized keywords in it, cl preferably closer to the beginning of it. And it needs to be clear and enticing for users to click. Remember, this is what we're going to actually see in search results for most of the time for, your search for, for the search result itself, is you're going to have this text here. So a clear and optimized title tag. The next thing is an enticing meta description. Now, remember, meta descriptions are not used for ranking purposes, but they are tremendously important for click-throughs. Uh, so this is, the, this is your chance to write copy that's going to entice people to click through your result rather than the other ones that are going to be on the search result page. After that, we have a short, optimized URL. So the important here thing here is that it needs to be short, so it's easily shareable, so it's easy to understand from a search engine perspective. But it also needs to contain the keywords that you're trying to rank for. Uh, so keep it there. Keep it in plain English. Use the phrases people are actually using to get to your site. Uh, but keep it as concise as humanly possible. Now let's talk about the page itself. Uh, what does this actually look like? How are things structured? Well, the first thing you want to do is you're going to want to make sure that it is structured in the same way that people expect to see websites, meaning there is a title at the top if it's appropriate. There's some kind of navigational elements around the site. Uh, there are pictures to make this um, worthy of me to spend the five minutes of my internet time uh, grazing looking at your content. Uh, and you need to have text that is well written. And this all, all is very hard to quantify, but it's things that you're going to need to just take a look at and, and work with your team for. Things that are interesting, there's an attitude with the page that it has some kind of opinion. It's expressing information. It's giving me the answer to whatever question I may have. Uh, you need to make sure this content, at the end of the day, is written for humans. This is something that I would share with my best friend because I think this is the single best source on the internet for whatever my information need is at that moment. After that, it needs to be bot accessible. So I actually see this problem all the time uh, with some of the major news publications in the world. They'll have a really outstanding article, or they'll have a really beautiful uh, photo gallery, but they've done it in a way where the search engines can't see it, which means that on the internet, it's almost useless, which is a, which is a shame. It's sad when this happens. What you need to do is you need to make sure that you have the world's best content, which is hard enough, but you also have to make it accessible to search engines. So this is certainly very doable. Just avoid technologies like Flash and, say, Silverlight, and use more of these open standards like HTML5. That will get you all the way there. The next one is social. It needs to be social and it needs to be shareable. So I had mentioned the my um, when I'm trying to create content that the bar that I tried to rise to is that it is shareable for my best friend. Well, you need to facilitate that sharing. You need to have some kind of way for them to actually share it. So this could be as simple as adding uh, the social sharing buttons, or it could be something as easy as enticing them and giving them a call to action at the end of the article to share it with their friends or share it with people who are important to them. Uh, sharing on the internet is extremely important, not just for ethical reasons, but for marketing reasons, for bottom line reasons. Uh, so make sure that you're facilitating that. The last one, and it is certainly not the least important one, uh, is multi-device ready. So I don't care if you use adaptive design. I don't care if you use responsive design. Just make sure that this content that you've spent so much time crafting is going to work and is going to be consumable easily on my tablet and on my phone and on my gigantic TV and all these other devices so that when it comes time, when you finally earned that person coming to your website to consume your really wonderful content, that they're able to see it on whatever device it may be holding. So, this is a general overview of what a perfectly optimized website would look like. Now, remember, this, this is going to shift depending on context. But make sure if you cover, to cover all of these bases so that the signals that we've all talked about make sense and you have a real lasting impact with this. The two broad categories of ranking signals are popularity and relevancy. Of the on-page factors, title tags are the most important individual field. Header tags are important, but less so than they were in the past. URL is important and should be semantic. Alt text is important for search engine as well as for blind humans. Avoid keyword stuffing and link sculpting. You should always avoid keyword stuffing, hidden text, 
repetitive anchor text, and cloaking. Natural language processing is a technology that aims to understand the intent and semantic structure behind text written by humans. Keywords are the ideas or topics that clearly describe what your content is about. Say, for example, here the title of the slide is What is Keyword Research? So, this is the keyword which suggests that this slide contains the content about keyword research. So, basically, keyword research is a process of identifying keywords or popular search terms that people tend to search for. When you identify relevant keywords, all you need to do is include these keywords smartly into your content. And this will help your content to get higher rankings in search results. Now the question arises, why does keyword research has so much of importance in search engine optimization? Let's understand this. Keyword research plays a major role in driving traffic organically to your website or your content. But how does this exactly happen? When you select the most appropriate keyword for your content, there is an opportunity where you can rank high in search results. By ranking higher, there are more chances that audience can discover your content and reach to your website. Thus, you get more and more consistent traffic growth for your website, thereby indirectly promoting your products and services. Now that you are aware of how keyword research holds importance, let's now see some essential types of keywords, that is long tail keywords and short tail keywords. So first we will start with long tail keywords. Long tail keywords are the keywords that are mostly used to get more specific results. Long tail keywords include keywords with three or more words. For example, shoes for a black dress. Now coming to short tail keywords. Short tail keywords are the general keywords or more specifically general search terms. Short tail keywords include one or two words in the keyword. For example, shoes. Now, let's see the difference between both the long tail and short tail keywords by demonstrating. Let's go to google.com. So, now we are here to check the difference between long tail keywords and short tail keywords. So, first, we will check for the short tail keyword. Now, suppose I am looking for the shoes that should go perfectly with my beautiful black dress. So here I add shoes and see how the results are appearing. Okay, if you see the recommendations, here we get shoes for men, shoes for women, shoes images, shoe size chart, shoes for rainy season, etc. etc. And if I enter here only shoes, what are the results? Here I get number of results from the shopping website. Uh, with the uh, very number of shoes, with number of brands and somewhere locations of the shops. But none of the result is relevant to what I am expecting, that is the shoes for my black dress. Okay, so now I'll just change my search query. I'll add a long tail keyword here and I will search here more specifically for what I wanted. So here I'll add shoes for black dress. Okay. So here I am getting number of ideas, the image ideas in the search result. That what kind of shoes are going to go best with my black dress and here I'm getting several combinations which I can wear with my black dress so 12 best color shoes here again I'm getting 
if we observe clearly then all these uh, results are completely aligned to what exactly i am looking for okay and if i again change this query more specific like shoes for black dress for woman let's see what i get so here i am getting more specific results in terms of women's we will definitely understand how to use long tail keywords or short tail keywords during our research in the upcoming part of this video let's now have a look on tools required for carrying out keyword research here i have got a small list of tools that you will need to perform effective keyword research so first we will begin with keyword planner keyword planner is a free keyword research tool provided by google some of the important features of keyword planner includes discovery of new keywords estimate monthly searches for a keyword get the average cost of ads for the keyword you are looking for and help to organize keywords the next tool that we have in our bucket is sem rush some important features of sem rush includes helps to get competitor keywords data it helps to get competitor backlinks data finds competitors top performing content helps in getting competitors campaign data etc let me bring it to your notice that sem rush is one of the best platforms that fulfill all your seo needs so do visit to semrush.com you can find the link in the description box below next tool that we have in our bucket is rfs the free keyword generator tool by rfs helps to discover keyword ideas helps in identifying the search volume estimations identify easy keywords for which you can possibly rank for helps you to get a list of long tail keywords and however it is not limited to google searches only yes you heard it right you can get keyword ideas for google bing youtube yahoo etc now let's check another tool which is google trends google trend will come into action during your keyword research when you are looking for the top search queries by users that is the most trending queries moreover you can check these details of search queries for your country for any other country or even worldwide not only this but you can also choose a type of search for this query like web search image search youtube search etc the next tool that we have is answer the public tool answer the public tool has free as well as paid versions this tool can prove a magic wand for your business as it suggests the questions that are asked by people in your industry this can help you to understand and create strategies for the content that the users are searching across the internet and the last tool in our today's list is keywordtool.io keywordtool.io has free as well as paid versions in the section on on page optimization we talked about factors that centered on relevancy in this section we're going to go in a different direction and we're going to talk about the signals that focus on popularity. So what does popularity mean in this context? Well, it's actually quite simple. Popularity always relates to links, to hyperlinks on the web. So you have seen these when you see the typically blue text that is underlined. What this is, it is a um, tool, it's a ahref technically in HTML that is pointing from one web document to a different one. Uh, this is a pretty simple concept. I imagine you already know this. So what does this mean from an SEO perspective? Well, it turns out that this gigantic group of signals, the ones related to hyperlinks, are in are and historically have been the lion's share of signals that the search engines process when trying to rank pages. Now, there's one big problem with these from an SEO perspective um, is that 
they are historically and today very difficult to influence. Uh, this is because they do not take place on your website, they take place elsewhere. It's other people who are linking to you, generally speaking. Uh, and this makes them very, very difficult to have an influence on. So this is a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it, it turns out to be a great metric for ranking web documents. It's a bad thing because it's hard for us to make an impact on day-to-day -day level. Hands down, the most time-consuming and difficult part of SEO is link building. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this, um, primarily because it's constantly changing and because of all the elements that are involved with this. But the, big, the bigger takeaway here is that there's no one-size-fits-all solution for link building. You have to take the context of your business or of your website, and you have to apply general principles to that. So in this video, we're going to cover these general principles so that you can figure out how to apply those to your business. These principles are, and I think these are the most clever and the most important ones, are creating link-worthy content, proactively participating in off-site engagement, and utilizing offline relationships. The tried and true method for building links is creating content that's optimized for humans. So let me explain what this means. The currency of the internet, if you will, is the content itself. That's why people go on. They want to read the newest article or they want to see the newest video. Whatever it may be, that is what has been true since the beginning and I have no doubt will be true going forward. So as an SEO or as an online marketer in general, you can use this to your advantage. Creating the content that people are going to want to share with their friends or that they're going to want to cite in any kind of paper or whatever they're working on, that is a tried and true way of gaining links. This is what we call the power of content. You can do all kinds of bells and whistles, you can go do these newest tactics, you can try all these different things out, but at the end of the day, what's really important is the content itself. So this is what I focus on. This is where 80% of my time goes on when I'm working on link building. It's on the content itself. Can I create something that is just truly, that is so truly great that someone essentially has to link to it? This is what I focus on trying to answer. And while there is no simple answer to that, going and asking that question always sets you in the right direction. The next strategy that I want to talk about is actually very counterintuitive. So if you're trying to build links to your own website, I found one of the most effective ways, and this is consistently true, is to engage off your own site. Uh, now, this doesn't make any sense, right? Why would you work on other people's websites if you're trying to promote your, yourself? Well, think about human beings. Human beings are much more likely to link and give back to people, to human beings that they know well. So a lot of the time I spend when I'm doing link building is spent off-site engaging with others. So sometimes this is through social media, so I'll use whatever the latest social network is, and I'll chat with people there who have similar interests or have similar interests to what I'm trying to promote, be it a different topic or be it a new industry altogether. I'll spend a lot of time promoting others and a lot of times chatting with other people, building up genuine, real relationships with human beings so that when it comes time for them to write an article or when, it's, when they're ready to link out to other people, I'm the first person they think to and they link back to my website. One of the reasons that link building is so hard is because the internet moves so fast. What worked yesterday might not work tomorrow. So one of the most clever and easy ways to avoid this problem is to just simply go offline. Utilize some of the relationships that you have off of the internet in order to benefit on the internet. This is something that I try to do all the time because it consistently works. By far, the easiest favors to cash in on are the ones that you're already owed. So these might be from your friends who you work with, these might be from friends who from childhood. These are people who you actually know in the real world who are much more likely to help you when you're trying to promote new content online. So when I'm trying to do link building, one of the things I focus on is people that I know in the real world. So this can be lots of things. This can be personal friends who happen to have websites and blogs. This can be friendly competition you have or friendly allies you have in your space, just saying, hey, we're looking for these kind of things. Can you help us out? And maybe I'll help you out somewhere else. It's utilizing these relationships that exist elsewhere so that you can start gaining these links yourself. Uh, if that doesn't work, if maybe you don't have any friends in these arenas, you can always go to local businesses and uh, local agencies. So sometimes this is um, like government-owned things, sometimes this is just third parties altogether. There's lots of things that they need help with that you as a business owner or you as uh, trying to promote some client may be able to help them with. And if you can help them offline, they're more, much more likely to help you online. When link building, it's very important to understand that not all links are, are created equally. A link coming from the homepage of CNN is going to provide a lot of what we call link equity. It's going to have a lot of popularity metrics tied to it, and so it's going to be more valuable to you and help you rank higher. Whereas a link also coming from the homepage, but let's say Joe Schmo's spam blog, that is not going to be particularly helpful for you, and it actually in some cases could hurt you. So when you're going out and doing link building, make sure that you can stand behind the source of the link that is coming at you. This could be in a good example from like a government website where it's trusted, and a bad example this could be from a website that you would not normally go to even on your own. In addition to that, 
there's different kinds of links depending on the direction that they're going. So if a link is coming towards you, towards your website, that's called an inbound link. These are the ones that are very helpful for popularity metrics that we've talked about. There's also outbound links. These are links that you are linking to other people. Now generally there's a big misconception about this that you would think you would not want to link out to other people. But if you just follow the natural chain of events and you look at people who are writing blogs without SEO in mind, you'll see that they are linking out naturally. And it's these natural patterns that the search engines are looking for. So there's absolutely no problem in linking out just as long as it's to sources that you actually do trust. So there's inbound links, there's outbound links, there's links that have a lot of popularity value, so like from an established government website or from something popular like CNN. There's also links that are inbound that are not going to have as much value for you that you probably don't want to spend your time building. Now, regardless of where your links are coming from, it's important to look out for one particular attribute. It's called rel nofollow. Rel nofollow was a tool that was originally developed to combat comment spam, like on blogs. You'd have lots of people who were leaving um, completely irrelevant comments so that they could link back to their own website and get credit for that. That does not work at all today. Uh, one of the primary reasons for that is the search engine introduced something called rel nofollow, where they said, here's a link that's going out from my website, but I do not stand behind it, and it does not pass any credit. A lot of times when you're doing link building, you'll get a link which you're very proud of coming from somewhere very popular, but then realize that it has this attribute attached to it, no follow, uh, and which means you will not get any credit for it. So make sure that when you're doing your link building, that the link coming at you that you've earned does not have this attribute associated with it, otherwise you will get no credit for it. Now that you understand what no follow is, let's, let's talk about the biggest use case for this, social media. Most of the links that we see in social media are valueless. Uh, this is because they are either uh, hidden from search engines entirely, this mostly happens on Facebook, or they're visible to search engines, but they use this, ro this rel nofollow attribute, which means that they're useless. So while social media does have many, many benefits, uh, SEO, and particularly link value from SEO, is not one of the direct benefits of participating in social media. Now that we've covered some of the link building do's, let's talk about some of the link building don'ts. So these are things that you should not do uh, because you'll be wasting your time and possibly more importantly, your money. The first one is spam. So we have all seen this online when you go somewhere and you see just a bunch of spammy links, links that are clearly written only for uh, machines, only for search engines. A lot of times these will have the name of pharmaceutical drugs on them. A lot of times they'll have, um, just can be completely irrelevant to the content. While these have worked in some instances, they are certainly not a best practice and they are certainly not a long-term strategy. So I never recommend trying to invest in spammy links this way because it's not gonna ultimately help you. In fact, in many ways, it'll probably hurt you. So do not go out of your way to try to get spammy links. The next one is buy-in links. This is, these are closely tied together. Now, buying links is when you go out and try to buy sometimes relevant, sometimes irrelevant links. And again, this is something that had it worked eh, sometimes historically, not always. My biggest problem with this is not so much the ethical problem, although there is one there. Uh, the search engines have clearly said not to ever do this. Um, my biggest problem with it is that you could not calculate an accurate ROI on this. So if you spend a dollar on this, you don't know if you're going to make a dollar or two dollars back. You have no idea. There's no way to accurately measure this. So you have no idea if this, if this is valuable to you or not. Where, as opposed to, if you're creating valuable content, you can measure that, and you can directly tie it to sales. So your, your money, dollar for dollar, is spent much, much more effectively on content than it is on buying links. So I highly recommend do not spend your time or your money buying links. The last one is acquiring reciprocal links. So reciprocal links, as you can imagine, are links that go in a circle. You link to somebody and they link directly back to you. Now in the natural web, when no marketing is taking place into this, and there's no kind of manipulation trying to go on, that happens that happens all the time. So don't go out of your way and be afraid of this happening. So one news site will very regularly link to another news article and that article might link back to them somewhere else. That happens. So don't stress about this too much. But don't go out of your way to try to build all of your links in a reciprocal way. We're overthinking this by trying to link to somebody else who links to a third party, that third party links to you. Don't waste your time. This is just not a factor that you should worry about. Reciprocal links are not generally as good as one-way links, but it happens so often that it is not is not worthy of your time or any kind of investment trying to avoid this. So if you are looking to become an SEO professional, then look no further than Simply Learn's postgraduate program in digital marketing. Gain in-depth knowledge of search engine optimization. With this course, you will also learn content marketing, web analytics, keyword management and research, website optimization, and much more. Unlock a whole toolbox of skills, including SE ranking, Hootsuite, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Google Ads, and Keyword Planner. 
don't miss out on this opportunity. Find the course link in the description for more information. The concept of linking is foundational to good rankings and understanding the internet at large. It starts with the premise that good content will be cited by others, recommending it to other people. How we cite and recommend information online is by linking to it. We link to information that we find valuable. Based on that, the search engines assess content by how websites link to one another. So we are going to cover the definition and purpose of links and the different functions that links serve. We'll also look at how links mirror human judgment. We'll look at how search engines evaluate links by mirroring human judgment and how that affects what's called block level analysis and how where the location of different links and how they are used will greatly affect their relevance. We're going to look at how visitors from different link sources will behave differently based on where they came from and also how you can measure the effectiveness of links and finally we're going to look at both good and bad linking practices. Now links serve a number of purposes. From a functional standpoint they usually are our primary means of navigation online. We click on links, we go to different pages, and from those pages we find links to other pages. Links are also a method of citing other content. When we quote somebody, when we use information that we have found somewhere else, we cite that information to give credit to the original author. Typically, online, we do that with a link, so that if someone wants to see the original source document, it's available to them. That also helps to provide credibility to you, credibility to the author of the original source, as well as assigning importance to the knowledge that came from that original source and the authority of the original source. Links also provide us with a clear structure of how our websites are built, how the pages relate to one another, and how organized the information can be. So let's break down the functional part of a link. This is important if you're going to be developing anchor text and linking to understand the structure. The ahref equals is the start of the link tag. What you are doing is developing the reference of where the document is contained. That's the href. Reference is what it is short for. What comes next within the quotes is the location of the document. Now this can be a full URL or you may just be linking to a document that's on the main root level of your server. This is the full location where you can access the document. And so you're putting the name of the document, the extension, so that it will be linked. The next part is what I have in caps. You'll notice off to the left I have something in all blue text and underlined, which most people will recognize as a link. You see, when it is in between the document location and the closing of the link tag, the text you have in there is what's called anchor text. You see, instead of publishing the document location and the full URL of the document, we can put the link within text and create anchor text. So all someone has to do is click on the link and the document loads for them. This anchor text is vitally important to understanding how we can add additional relevance to linking content. Then we see the closure of the link tag. This is what makes the internet. The internet is millions of pages connected together by links. So when we look at the functional side of links. And we look at this example here. As you can see, the title of this article is not the URL address of the article. It's a title, and the title is the link. That is the anchor text of the link. And so, from a search engine standpoint, search engines look to see what words are being used in the link and how relevant those words are to the document that is being linked. 
it also looks to see where is the link is it in the editorial information in the article is it part of the navigation is it in a sidebar or is it an ad and then also search engines are looking to see if this is a text link or an image link how long has that link been there what type of link is it does it go somewhere within your website does it go to another website or is it a reciprocal link which I will explain more later they also look to see the text in the link and the context to the page with the link directs you to we utilize links a little differently you see from a human standpoint whenever we refer information to another person when we provide reference material to another person or even if someone asks us for a recommendation we provide this information you see offline we mirror the same behavior as we do online when we link people ask us for information and we provide it we just mirror that online by making a link offline we recommend we refer we provide information to each other in much the same way the way I want you to think about it from a human standpoint is that if you asked another person for advice or directions or a referral are there certain people that you would trust more than others I'm sure the answer to that is yes and maybe you have some people in mind that you are thinking about you see we run across the same issue with search the search engines know that there are some websites that are much more trustworthy than others just like if you were to ask someone for information I'm sure you would ask the right person for the information you would ask the most knowledgeable trustworthy person you knew who had authority in that subject area the search engines are trying to do the same thing with the links that we publish on our websites they're trying to determine who is the most trustworthy and relevant based on the recommendations referrals and citations of other websites to other websites who are the websites that are trusted that are authorities the search engines are trying to do from a technical algorithmic standpoint what we do naturally from a human standpoint now from the human side as I had said before we need to think of links as information that we receive from other people word-of-mouth advice information directions recommendations this is where we need to think about links not from the standpoint of building false relevance for a search engine but being a helpful resource for our readers how can we help them how can we provide information and how can we be a credible source of information how can we develop our authority within the industry and so that people who have questions about this content will see our websites as authoritative and credible resources the best way to develop links as you'll see is good content when people like what they read when they like what they see when they are willing to recommend it to others it's because you have created something of value and they'll link to you when they feel that you are credible and that you are authoritative with this information only then will they share it with other people because you have earned that right for them to share it with others by providing content that is informative educational entertaining and you've provided that service only then will people then want to recommend it to others by linking to it now links serve a number of benefits when I look at some of the incoming links to my site one of the things I notice is that if I get a link in certain places that can drive a lot of brand exposure I can have thousands of people coming to the site looking to see an article and that provides a lot of exposure to a lot of people however also getting a link from a certain website especially if it's a high relevant authoritative website I can see my rankings increase because of that but then also a good link 
is going to drive people that will convert and drive sales or leads, those who become customers. So those are the three aspects of a good link. A good link will drive traffic to your site, a good link will assist your rankings, and a good link will bring in business. If you can get a link to do all three of those at the same time, that's what I call the golden link because it has all three benefits. Usually, however, you're going to find that different links will provide different types of benefits, one of these three or maybe two out of these three. One of the things I'm usually very focused on is the link that drives sales or generates leads. That's getting links in the right place that will benefit me tangibly rather than just getting thousands of people to see it. Why? It benefits me financially if I can get a link in the right place. So from here, let's break down the different types of links. We have navigational links. We see these in our navigation, our primary navigation, maybe the footer of our web pages where we have links to typical information such as about us or contact us. We also have sidebar links. This might be related information or offers or calls to action. And then also I would break it down into outbound or inbound type of navigation. Outbound are links going to other websites. Inbound links are links that come from other websites and that also I might send to other pages on my own site. Now I've used the term editorial. An editorial link is a link that is found within the content of the website. And by that I mean through an article. So if I am writing an article and I link to someone else and cite them or reference them, that is what's called an editorial link. It means that it's part of the content. A great example of this is that the navigation on your web pages is not part of the content. It serves a function as navigation, but it doesn't have anything to do with supporting information, with citing an authority. So information and links that you put within the content and presented content of your site are considered editorial. Now there's also call to action links where you're bringing someone to a landing page or a registration page or a sale page. Then also we have social links. Now these can provide a, a variety of means, but typically a social link will go to a profile. Maybe it's a username that takes you somewhere else or a comment or maybe just an image or something that goes to a social site or that you have placed on your own site as well. Either way, it's all contained within that social network. Even though the links are going on and off your site, they tend to be controlled in that social environment. Now I've used the term reciprocal link. Now this is something very specific. A reciprocal link is one where you would go to somebody else and you would make a trade, such as if you link to me, I'll link to you. And maybe you put those links on the home page, or maybe you create a page just for that link. You see, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. And so the search engines will see that you've linked to each other, but if there's no contextual relevance, if there's no contextual relevance, most likely you won't get any benefit because you've agreed to link to each other for the primary purpose of boosting rankings. Now this is not to say that two websites can't link to each other because there is some relevance. We'll look at some examples of that later on in this module. Also then, we have advertising links. These can be ads, banners, anything on the page that is an advertising link that if you were to click on it, you would go to that advertiser's page. Those links are typically through an ad server and they take place in an entirely different ecosystem. But they are links, and we need to know what kind of links are advertising and which kind of links are functional to our websites. Now, when I broke down the different types of links, so we have our navigation links, we have links in our sidebar and in our footer. What block level analysis does is that the search engines look at the code of the page. 
They break down the page because it's very easy to figure out which part of the code has to do with your navigation, which part of the code has to do with your sidebar and your footer, and which part of the code is calling ads from an ad server. What this leaves is the editorial content, your article, and the ability of search engines then to break down your page into these different elements. The reason why they do it is that the links contained in the editorial space are considered to be more relevant in terms of linking to other websites than any of the other types of links on your web page. Search engines don't consider all parts of the page to be equally relevant, which is okay because neither do humans. We look at the navigation as utilization, pure utility, because it's just helping me navigate among the different pages of your website. I'm not expecting to learn anything. I'm using it as a functional means of navigating your site. Now your sidebar might have some calls to action, it might have links to other pages, but it's not an article. It's what you've developed. And so it might be a little more important than your navigation, but it's not as important as what you may have written within content. Your footer navigation is basically the same. You control that, it's the same on every page. And so what the search engines are looking for are the unique content, the unique article or information that you've published. And if there is a link within that editorial content, that is highly relevant because it has to do with content. It has to do with information that you are sharing. And so the links there are going to be more highly relevant and are going to be more important for the search engines to see. You see, it's the same way with humans. We're not going to look at navigation to learn something. It's functional. The same thing with the footer. And as humans, we're reading the content that you have in your article. And if you link to another source, well, you've provided us with utility. But it's contextual utility because you're citing where you found information or you're citing an additional source or you are linking to an example. And it enables me as a human to see that, understand it, and if I need that additional information, I can click on it and go to it. So I'm going to look at the information on the page in that article very differently than I'm going to look at the headings, the navigation, the sidebars, or the footer. Because the article is what is informing me. And so the links in the article, I'm going to look at very differently and hold them in a higher level of relevance. Now, over time, search engines have had to refine the algorithm about links. You see, in the early days of search engine algorithms, they used to simply count the amount of links. Then if one site had more links than another, that made it more credible. However, once people started to figure that out, people started accumulating links by really any means necessary and they were just looking for the sheer volume of links because they knew if they got the most amount of links, it would affect their rankings. And so over the years, the search engines have had to change and adjust and add more relevance to their algorithm, refine it in order to look at different aspects of links in order to properly determine relevance. So over time, it wasn't just having a link. It was then also looking at how many people cite this site as an authority? So looking at the source of the link and the types of pages. Then also looking at the text of the link and matching it with the text of the page. Does it match? Is it contextual? And then looking at the type of link, doing the block level analysis, and then also the context, the relevancy of your site compared to the linking site, compared to the link, and the information that's being shared there. Also, some of the ways that they can look at it are the age of the link. How long has that link been there? Humans do the same thing when we look to see how long someone has been in business. We're looking at credibility. And then, of course, there are many, many other ongoing refinements that are going into the search engine's evaluations of links. Sometimes the age of the link isn't as relevant, especially when you're looking for something that has happened very recently. An old link could mean that it's old news or that something has changed since then. So search engines are in a constant battle to ensure that people are not gaming the system by falsely creating relevance through linking. The link relevancy 
and the algorithm is all about trying to determine who is the most relevant and credible within this area. And that is the focus of most search engine algorithm refinements over the past few years, and it will be into the future. Now, this is where I'm going to start bringing in some screenshots from a link management program. As a search engine optimizer, a link management program is probably going to be one of your best friends as you move along in this industry. In this example, this program, LinkDex, that I'm using will track the incoming links to my website. And it'll also provide a breakdown as to what type of website those links are coming from. So I can see how many links I have from blogs, how many links I have from news sites, how many links from wikis, how many links from directories, forums, social media, public relations sites, articles, or additional resources. Then I can also add my competitors and I can compare where I stand in terms of the amount of links from each source and where my competitors stand. In this way, I can be sure that we all have a similar link profile. You see, if my linking profile looks vastly different than all my competitors, the search engines are going to see that as well and know that something might be different with me, good or bad, and that's going to raise a red flag. So I want to look at the linking profile because every industry and almost every business's linking profile is going to be a little different. But especially among industries, we see that linking profiles, that is the amount of links from different sources, is going to be slightly different for every different type of industry or business. So this helps me understand where my links are coming from, which is vitally important because from a business standpoint, one thing that I've tracked consistently in analytics is that people will act differently and also I can predict which source is going to send me the best customers. You see, just because someone comes from a link doesn't mean they're going to buy or become a customer or really become a lead. Many times they're going to come look at your information and leave. And based on how they come to your site, whether it's through a blog, a directory, a forum, or a news site, has a lot to do with how they view your website. And it's all about the context. You see, this is what I've learned over the years, is that people will behave differently based on how they find the website. What I've found is that people from blogs, news sites, and articles, they tend to stay longer, do more, and have a higher chance of conversion. Of becoming a customer or a lead the main reason is because blogs and articles they have a lot of context it's an article someone has taken the time to write some information out and then link to my site which means there is a highly contextual reason for someone to click that link also what it means is that there's a lot less competition for that link when my link is in that article Compare that with social news or any type of social site. You see, when you're on a social site and you're looking at your social stream of information, there's a lot of different people competing for your attention, a lot of different things. And it's not just in one subject area. It's usually from multiple subject areas. And so the context is very low because there's a lot of different types of information and the competition for your attention is very high. Because of that, people from social sites or applications tend to visit more often, but they only tend to view one page and leave immediately because they're looking to see what was interesting and then they move on to the next subject. That's the difference between how people react based on where they come from. And so when I'm measuring links, I'm looking to see which links do I have, What's the source? And then how do those sources behave differently from one another? And why? You see, if I find that I'm getting links from sources that people are staying longer, doing more, and converting at a higher rate, then I'm going to continue to focus on building links in those areas because it directly affects how I monetize my website. So here's a strategy in building links. 
One of the things I'm looking at is the source of links. Like I said, if I can find a link source that's providing visitors that will stay, look at my content, engage with the content, and eventually convert, and convert at a higher rate than other sources of content or visitors, then I'm going to focus on that source. And so I'm going to look at some high authority websites, whether they're industry publications, news sites, education sites, those are what are considered high authority blogs, articles, news sites. That's what I'm looking to do. I want to find the most authoritative website. And sometimes it happens naturally. If people that work at those websites or manage those sites, if they find you and they like your content, they'll link to it. And that way you can get more credibility, more relevancy. Certain people, certain organizations, certain websites have more authority and influence than others. It goes back to the question that I asked you early in this module, that how do you know if someone is more authoritative than somebody else? We also have mid-authority websites, which you can get some links on, and low-authority websites, which are very easy to get links. But here's what I've learned when it comes to link building. One link from one high-quality website can be worth hundreds or thousands of mid to low quality links. Ultimately, it's about quality, not quantity. One of the things that I will do utilizing my link software is look at the context of the link. I want to see how relevant this is. So as I said, if I want to find a high relevant website, what I'm looking for in terms of this is I want to see the influence of the domain as well as the relevance of the domain. Those are two factors that we're going to look at when we're evaluating the quality of a domain. Now, as I'm looking at this report here, what influence means is that it is a high quality website, that within the linking algorithm, these sites have a lot of authority. However, they may not be relevant. So for example, they may have a lot of sites attributing authority to them, but they may not be relevant to my industry, which is why we have the next column of keyword relevance. You see, when I'm evaluating my links, I'm looking for the sources that are both influential and relevant. That means that I've got a link from a site that fits the two standards of high authority. It's authoritative and relevant. Now, it's good to have links from authoritative sites that might not be relevant. It's still authoritative. However, to get the full benefit, I want it to be influential and relevant, but not to say that I'm not looking for links from these other sources. This is just a means of measuring what you have as well as comparing it to your competitors and other websites. Now, here's some best practices. When I'm optimizing anchor text, I want to maintain contextual relevance. So I want to use text in the text link, and I want to explain to people what they're linking to, what they're going to find when they click on that link. If I use an image as a link, I'm going to use an alt attribute, because if that image doesn't show up, that alt attribute is necessary to let people know where to go. But also, I do get a little tiny bit of benefit by using that alt attribute within the image link. I also want to look at the relevance of the source page that I'm linking to and make sure contextually the link, the link text, and the content of the page is contextually relevant to the destination page. I also want to be sure that I don't overuse the keywords, that I don't make multiple links to the same destination, that I don't use the same anchor text over and over. I can be downgraded or even penalized by the search engine algorithm if that is found on my pages. So as an example, instead of using click here for a how-to article, I might use the exact phrase of how to fix whatever it is and use that as the link to the page that has the content. 
That's a simple way of looking at anchor text. Am I directing someone to additional information? If I am, then how can I present it to them so they know exactly what they're going to find and link it appropriately? I look at it as developing the next step for your readers. Where do you want them to go? What do you want them to do? What resources do you have available to them? How can you structure them so that they're easily understood and you're explaining the final destination? Like I said, if you overuse anchor text, you can be downgraded or penalized by the search engines. So what I will tell you to do is number one, avoid overstuffing anchor content. That means needlessly repeating keywords in the anchor text. Don't do that. Avoid being redundant, meaning don't have four or five or six links with the same anchor text going to the same page. That's a clear way of letting search engines know that you're going overboard. Don't just randomly place links throughout your text just to get the link. Ask yourself, are you really helping the reader find the information they need and do it once? And then also avoid extremely overly promotional words within the link text, such as best, expert, cheap, number one, those types of things. So a couple examples, we can say for travel advice, click here, but I would say here is my travel advice and link travel advice. Rewrite it, be creative. If it were easy, everyone would be doing it. But this is where you can write things in a better way to get the attention of the reader and position it as a resource. Also, utilizing your URL as the link, or as the anchor text as well for the link in order to get that click. As I've got it here, I would not recommend that you use that. I would recommend that you avoid that. Also, the third line, the check out the best website for iPhones and iPhone accessories. Utilizing overly promotional words is one of those ways that you can easily get caught by the search engines. Now, for future considerations when it comes to links, realize that the majority of algorithm changes are link-based evaluation refinements because people are constantly attempting to fool the search engines and develop a false link profile. You should work to create high-quality links with high-quality content. I wouldn't chase after poor or low-quality links. Now, as I've mentioned before, there are a number of tools available for you to manage and measure your backlinks. Tools such as LinkDex, Moz, Raven, Advanced Link Manager, Majestic SEO, and then also you can use your Google Analytics as well. However, Google Analytics only shows you the visitors that have come from links and what they've done. The basic functions of link management software, and there are many other types other than what are listed here, but the first thing that it does is just provide a catalog of incoming links from other domains to your site and your competitor sites. They offer tools for comparison to see which domains are linking to you, what type of link it is, and on which pages those links are listed. They'll also report newly acquired links in the past 30, 60, 90 days, or something similar to that. The purpose of link management software is to help you assess high quality domains versus low quality domains in terms of importance and relevance. Like I said, the first job of a link management tool is to collect all of your backlinks. You add your domain and the tools will usually spider the domain. They'll go out into search engines and go out into many other formats in order to find and retrace who is linking to you what page that link is contained, sometimes what text is on that page and what text is being used in the link. They will catalog all of your incoming links, organize them, format them, and report back to you. Most of these link programs provide additional filters and management tools so that you can get more insights about who is linking to you, 
how they are linking to you, and the type of site. Personally, I use link decks in order to monitor and report on my backlinking. So the first report here that I'm showing out of link decks is that I see the total amount of incoming links to my domain. This says I have over 2,000 links, and those 2,000 links are on about 1,000 domains. On average, it looks like I have about two links from every domain that is linking to me. So this is one way that you start to look at your links. Number one, the total amount of domains that are linking to you, and then the total amount of links available. This way you can isolate domains that are linking to you consistently and also find those that may not be the best domains or that are sending a lot of links that are just not relevant. The next thing I do in analyzing my links is to look at the type of link, meaning the type of site that it's coming from. This report breaks down the amount of links coming from blogs, news sites, directories, forums, social sites, articles, or resources. Now, it doesn't usually get all of those links, but it does get enough to give you an idea of how well you're doing in each channel. One of the things that I do like about this report is it also has a timeline. So I can look and see when new links have been acquired and maybe when some links have been just disappeared. That's called churn, and it's normal. It's normal because many times a link is published on social media and it kind of just goes away or it's not tracked anymore by your link management software. It can't find it anymore. And so linking is always dynamic. You are always gaining new links and losing old links. There's going to be a normal amount of churn. The next report shows me all of the domains that are linking to me. It also shows me in the next column, how many of those domains are also linking to at least one competitor. And it will list as many competitors as I have listed in here if they list to multiple competitors. It will let me know the influence of that site or the authority that site is seen because of the amount of websites and credibility that authority has for that domain. It will also let me know the keyword relevance, how relevant that website is overall contextually to my domain and the content that I have. It will also let me know how many pages on that domain have links to my website. So I can also go through and I can filter this list by the type of site. I can filter by those domains that are using anchor text to see how much anchor text is being used and what type of anchor text. There are many different ways that you can filter through all of the domains that are linking to you in order to get an idea of what's happening on your domain, what are competitors doing, and also the relevance of those links to your site. Now, when I say that I can add competitors, this is another type of report, very similar to the one I showed earlier, where I look at my own standing in the different types of sources of links, such as blogs, directories, forums, and so on. I can also, when I add my competitors, look to see how they are performing in those different areas as well. And so I can compare my link profile to my competitors. Different industries are going to have different backlink profiles. They might be more heavily weighted towards blogs, or they might be more heavily weighted towards forums or social sites. In this way, I can look to see if my competitors are actively link building and how they're going about it. I can see where maybe they are excelling in one area that the rest of the competitors are not. So I can compare different strategies. I can also compare different timelines to see if I am acquiring links at a faster rate than my competitors. This is very important if you are a newer business or a newer website trying to compete. Now specifically what I can do is look at an individual domain in this case, this domain has three pages linking to me, and that domain also links to two of my competitors. I can look at the specific pages, and what I'm looking at here are snippets. This should be familiar to you because what it's showing is the URL of the page that's linking to my page. It shows me the page title of that page, and then in this report, 
It lets me know if there are any keywords being used in the link in the anchor text, as well as the number of links from that page. Now, what this tells me is that this is most likely a directory, something that is listing all the different places that where you can buy products, because it's most likely linking to the domain name, seeing that there are no keywords being used in anchor text, and also that there are 16 outbound links from that page. That means that it must be a list of some sort, and they are linking not only to me, but most likely to competitors as well. So I can track my links at the domain level and at the page level. I can look to see which pages might have more influence or relevance to my content. I can also see the link URL, the page title, if any keywords are being used in the anchor text, and also within the context of how many additional links are leaving from that page. If there are a high amount of outgoing links on that page, then a link from that page might not be as valuable since there are so many links. The less links there are coming out from that page, the more it will benefit my site because I'm getting more benefit from less links. Now also, what I'm going to do is compare the link reports to my analytics. I'm going to go to my analytics because linking software does not show traffic. It doesn't show how many people are clicking on the link. It only shows who's linking to you, but it does not show visitor activity. Analytics will show you visitor activity to see which domains are most effective in sending visitors to your site. If you go back to the primary benefits of linking, visitors, branding, and business. Analytics show me visitors and business. It shows me which domains are sending me visitors and which of those visitors are becoming customers. So what I can do is go to Google Analytics, look at all the domains that are referring traffic to my site. I can also click on the domain and see the destination page that they are linking to. I can see how many visitors are coming, either monthly or annually, how often they're coming back, whether they're new users or repeat users, how long they stay, how many pages they view, and how many conversions as a result of those visits. This is a great way to get a 360 degree view of your linking, because not only do you want links that will help you rank better, you also want links that will send business and customers to you as well. Building links can take many forms. Ideally, it is through networks, relationships, and marketing that other websites and users learn about you, like you, and recommend you to others. Unfortunately, there is a lot of bad, outdated, and untrustworthy advice to be found about building links to your website. In this section, I'll present the best practices as accepted by the OMCP standard. The objectives for this module, that you'll be able to develop a link building strategy, that you'll understand the value of different link types. Finally, you'll be able to find inbound link opportunities. The first step in building links is to evaluate what you have. Now there are many tools available that you can utilize to do this for you. There are automated tools that you can get that will catalog all of the incoming links to your website. Some of them are Linkdex, Moz, Raven, or Advanced Link Manager. There are many that can do that. You may also want to utilize your analytics as well in order to find websites that link to you. The first step is evaluating where you are right now. Your incoming links have a significant impact on your rankings. And you can do a lot of on-page optimization and see some results. However, a lot of Google's algorithm takes into account links from other high-quality websites. Now, when you evaluate what you have, in this example, I'm showing you a screenshot from Linkdex. Linkdex catalogs the incoming links to my website and it groups them into different areas. The first way it groups them 
is by high value or high influence domains. Those are websites that link to me that have a lot of influence, not necessarily in my industry, but high influence based on the amount of people that link to them as an authority on many different subjects. The next way that it groups that is based on relevance. Now this is when it looks at the match of my content versus the content of the other website. In the first example, we can see the National Library of Medicine. It is a high influence website because it is a government website with a lot of information that is cited frequently. Because of the amount of other websites linking to that site, it has a high amount of influence. Now based on the website that I am measuring, there is a lot of keyword relevance, meaning that that National Library of Medicine site with the government has a lot of content that's very similar to my site. A lot of the same keywords are being used. So not only is this website of high influence, it also has a lot of relevance. And that's key when evaluating my backlinks. I want to look at which websites are also referring traffic. So while I may have a link from the National Library of Medicine, I want to look at my analytics and look to see is it also providing visitors? Are visitors following that link to my site? And I also want to look at the quality of traffic that it produces. Do these visitors stay longer than average? Do they convert more than average? I want to look at the quality of traffic based on the source. Next, I want to look at the incoming links from those other websites. Number one, I want to make sure that the incoming link from the other site is both accurate and relevant, meaning the text that is used in the link, is it accurate to the content that will appear on the page when the visitor clicks that link? Is the content relevant? This is especially relevant if I have updated my website, changed the content, or moved things around. I want to be sure that that incoming link sends visitors to the appropriate page and the appropriate information. I also want to ensure that that link is worded correctly, that it uses the right words, that is sending visitors and setting expectations of the content that they will see. I may need to contact the website manager or owner and maybe ask for a better link text or a more accurate page destination. Now this requires some interaction with the owner or manager of another website and you always want to be respectful of their time and not demanding that they make any changes. In some cases the organization may be so big you may never find the right person in order to optimize the text or the destination of that link. You always want to look for accuracy in cases where your company or website name is utilized in the link, but also if there is any contact information such as address, phone number, a description of your business, and any content. Make sure it's accurate and it all points to the right place. Another way to look for links is to simply go to a search engine and start doing searches. Search for your company, your business, your company name, and look for websites that may mention you but do not have a live link to your website. Many times your company will be mentioned or cited but there will not be a live link. You can only find these through doing searches and seeing which websites mention you without linking to you. Now this could be an opportunity to get an easy link especially if you can find some contact information and finding the right person that could add a link to your company information. Again you'll need to be polite, ask for their help, and it will help it if you can develop the link along with the link text and send that over giving them just a quick and easy edit to be able to add the information. So make it as easy as possible. As an example, I've provided a sample request format. 
again, you want to be polite, you want to be inviting and respectful of their time and their management. Sometimes, like I said, you may find the right person that can help you. However, the larger the company, the more difficult it will be to make this happen. This just requires your patience and, again, being polite and not expecting the company to do what you are asking. Many times, this is just a formality, and sometimes companies will act on it. So be sure to approach this with the right expectations. The next thing I want to look at are business listings. These are the easy ways to establish links and ensure that links are where they should be and also opportunities. Look for business directories, especially if your company has a local presence. You can utilize Chamber of Commerce lists, association lists, or local listings. If they are on websites, see if they offer links that can go to your website rather than just the list of businesses that are in the area. Even on a larger level, you can look for associations, directories, or listings where you can add your business or double check if your business is there and always ensure that your business name, address, phone number, and URL are correct, complete, and consistent with other listings. The next level will require some active marketing, and that's where you search for opportunities. You can go out and look for other resource lists within your industry or directories of businesses within your industry, and you can get a link many times through membership or submitting your business as a resource. However, you may want to step up your marketing. You can do that by interviewing your clients, seeing if they might be willing to provide a testimonial and a link to your website. You may also want to go out and find other communities online, maybe some social communities that are relevant to your industry. Get involved with those communities, fill out a profile, and get involved by contributing information. By sharing information, you'll find that people like getting information and they'll respond by linking to your site. Another option is to utilize the tool that you had for indexing your links from the first step. You can also add your competitors and you can look at their backlinks. You can look and see which websites and which domains are linking to your competitors, but you always need to go and see why. What are those other sites linking to? And what is the nature of that link? Sometimes it may exclude you from being able to approach competitors' backlinks and ask them for links. However, if they're being linked to by companies that are simply stating, here are vendors in this space and they are linking your competitors and you're not there, then it might make a lot of sense for you to approach and ask if you can be listed as well. However, be sure that the links to your competitors are not from a consumer or customer relationship. In that case, it might be out of line for you to ask for a link. Make sure if you approach anyone who's linking to a competitor and asking for a link to your site, make sure the context is right and that it makes sense for them. And that's the ultimate judge of value. Does it benefit somebody else to link to your site? We all know that it will benefit you, but when you present your link request, you need to offer value and a benefit for others to link to you. So be sure that you present it in a way that is beneficial and good for those people that will be adding the link. They're the ones that have to take the work to do it, and they're also the ones that are adding a recommendation for you and your business. So as always, you need to be considerate and patient. Now, the best way to build links is by creating something that people like and sharing it. You see, the best way to build links is by creating value through content or information or entertainment. You see, when people like things, 
they link to it. If they find a study or a white paper or research that you performed, they link to it. If you post an infographic that explains something and it's attractive, people link to it. You see, that's what's most amazing about linking. I find that when we put most of our effort into creating content that people like, that's what builds the most valuable and the most relevant links. And so what type of content? Well, you can create infographics, videos, top 10 lists, or articles. Articles with advice or analysis of market data or even research. That type of content, people love it. And so when you publish it out, you utilize social media to extend the reach and the visibility of that type of content. And when someone likes it, they'll link to it and recommend it to others. Now people also like, depending upon your industry or your business, they also like some personality, maybe some humor. People always like expert information. They like the cute. This is why pictures of cats tend to be liked and linked to more than almost anything else. And also the unexpected. If you can inject any of that into your content, that just makes it more valuable, more personable, and again, more shareable by other people. And every time someone shares it, it builds a link to your site. You see, the best linking is when people like something. When you create something that people like and share, you might be surprised at the many opportunities there are to get links based on your content. I've seen many, many blogs based on cooking, fashion, arts, sports, music, and when people specialize within a specific topic, they always find an audience. And so anything they publish builds links. Even on certain social media sites, such as Pinterest, people upload pictures on articles and infographics, especially about landscaping, flowers, food, cars, you name it, there is a special interest for anything. And you can develop links from those social sites to your site, and it can generate traffic. Even with a blog, developing articles that talk about upcoming events, new music, sports, whatever it is, when you create content that people like, it takes the longest amount of time to build content for building links. When you develop your own content, that's the biggest investment you'll make in time and research and writing and presentation. However, the result is that when you develop that content, you will receive the best and highest quality links and the most valuable links are going to be to that content. As I mentioned before, one high quality link can be worth more than hundreds or thousands of low quality links. So my best advice is to create content that people like, that they link to, and that will be high value links that you'll generate to your site. So if you are looking to become an SEO professional, then look no further than Simply Learn's postgraduate program in digital marketing. Gain in-depth knowledge of search engine optimization. With this course, you will also learn content marketing, web analytics, keyword management and research, website optimization, and much more. Unlock a whole toolbox of skills, including SE ranking, Hootsuite, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Google, Google Ads and Keyword Planner. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Find the course link in the description for more information. Optimizing technical elements of a website such that search engines can easily crawl and index the web pages is known as technical SEO. Some technical optimizations include reducing the page loading speed of a web page to a minimum. Submitting sitemaps to search engines. Have organized website structure as it informs search engines about the essential pages of the website. Adding redirections for the deleted URLs or temporarily moving URLs. Identify duplicate content and replace it with unique content.
before I tell you how to bring traffic to your website, let me tell you why this is so important. Okay, why do we want to bring users to our website? I mean, it has to be on equal ground as web development and design is somebody who goes to your site and then does something when they get to your site. So you have users and when those users get to your site, they're generating page views and traffic and you want to turn that traffic into engagement. Okay, so each page's traffic is configured independently of all their pages. So when you go, when somebody goes to your website, they look at a page that's a page view. In certain pages on your website, you want to turn that page view into a conversion. Okay, whether that be, you know, looking at a video or purchasing something. So think of these pages on your website as salespeople. They're trying to convert visitors who come to your website. But first, we need to get the visitors to your website. So when you get visitors to your website, again, you can generate sales, which means revenue, or you can increase brand awareness, or you can earn revenue through sponsored posts and advertisements. So if you have, for example, a lot of content on your website, you can turn that in to revenue by hosting ads on your website. So when somebody clicks on that ad, you're going to earn a percentage of that click, okay, or what that click is worth. So having a website means a lot of good things for you but first you got to get the traffic there and so what we're going to do is we're going to tell you how to drive traffic to your website so there's lots of different ways in which you can bring traffic to your website well the first is paid advertising so paying to advertise your products services with ads is one of the easiest ways to drive traffic to your website so some of the options available are search ads social media ads or display ads so search ads are ads that are displayed in the search engine results. So when a user types in a keyword query, you want your ad to show up based on that keyword query. Okay, so an example is digital marketing course. Somebody types in digital marketing course and simply learn is the first ad that shows up. How do we know it's an ad? Because you can see the word ad next to the domain. So when somebody clicks on that link, simply learn is going to pay Google. So that's how search advertising works. Okay, the next is social. So social media marketing involves increasing traffic or engagement or brand awareness, or lots of different strategies. But you're, instead of doing this on search, you're doing it on a social media platform. Okay, so for example, you can advertise on any particular platform. And the way you advertise could be with an image, it could be with a video. So in this case, you could see Cobrio is doing a sponsored ad here, how to succeed with Google Ads. And then another form of advertising is display. So display means creating ads that are placed on specific websites. So with display, unlike search, you have a choice in the ad format. With search, you only have text ads. But with display, you have text ads, image ads, rich media ads, video ads. So you have lots of different options in which you can advertise on other websites. So the idea here is to get your ad in front of the right audience. When they could see your display banner, your banner ad, then it's going to be more visual, more appealing, generate some brand interest, and hopefully you can get somebody to click on that ad and over to your website. So that's paid advertising. Again, through search, through social, through display, but you can also promote your site on social media. So once your content has gone live, you could take advantage of different social media platforms. I mean, it really depends on what you're trying to promote because what you're trying to promote needs to align with the appropriate social media platform. So Facebook is best suited for industries like food and beverages and news and media and if you're selling a product. So you fall under one of those categories and Facebook could be the right platform for you. If you're involved in, again, beauty or food and beverage or e-commerce, then you can also leverage Instagram, which is part of Facebook's ecosystem. So if you advertise on Facebook, you can also advertise on Instagram and or Instagram. So it doesn't have to be and Facebook and Instagram. It could be Facebook or Instagram. You also have LinkedIn as a platform. LinkedIn is great for B2B. So if you're trying to promote industry news or, or tips and best practices or job postings, then LinkedIn is the place for you. It's a B2B platform. 
it's great for targeting specific industries, targeting specific job levels or job descriptions. Okay, so LinkedIn is great if you're into B2B, focusing on the business side of it. So you also have YouTube. Now YouTube is part of Google's ecosystem. YouTube is a video platform. Okay, so it's great if you're trying to promote gaming or entertainment, or if you're a vlogger. Okay, so YouTube's a great way to promote your site uh, by getting your product out there in the form of a video. Okay, and then you have Twitter. Twitter, to me, encompasses a lot of different industries, beauty and fitness, news and media, entertainment. Okay, you have limited number of characters, but a lot of people are active on Twitter. And it's a great way to generate some awareness and get some clicks over to your website. So these are just some of the most popular social media platforms. Of course, there are plenty more out there. The third way in which you can drive traffic to your site is guest post, put blogging. So most of you already know what blogging is all about. Well, if you're blogging for your own site, you can jump on somebody else's site and blog on their behalf. So having the opportunity to guest post on another website can be very helpful because one, that other blog could have lots of traffic and have a, a well-known brand. So if you're blogging on another blog, it's going to build your brand awareness and potentially increase traffic to your blog or website. So it exposes to you to targeted traffic. So if you're going to guest blog, guest blog on a site that's very relevant to your business or industry. That way you're targeting the right audience. Okay. You can expand your personal network. So getting yourself out there, getting your brand out there in front of a different audience. And then obviously for SERPs because it generates a backlink. So SERPs, search engine ranking pages means that, hey, if you want to rank organically, you're going to have to generate some backlinks. So guest blogging is an, a, a way to generate some backlinks to your site and an effect that's going to help you get your pages ranked higher because Google is going to recognize the relationship from one blog to your blog and build up your relevancy. So some other benefits here to guest blogging is you can grow your social media following because you can then promote that on social media, that you're guest blogging. Okay. Again, you can improve your online authority. Okay. Because when you're guest blogging and you have recognition on that guest blog, if it's a popular blog, then that's going to help your domain and page authority for SEO. And then the end result is going to improve your backlink score. So there are a lot of benefits to guest blogging. To me, at the end of the day, it's just about reaching out to your audience, using another platform to do that in the form of a blog. And the results of that is going to mean more brand awareness for you and turning that traffic from that other blog into qualified leads. So you can also interview industry thought leaders. So that's another way, an interesting way to generate traffic to your site. So reaching out to thought leaders for interviews, okay, could generate some credibility for you and the other person. So it's reciprocal. So it means that you're active in the industry that you're in. And it allows you to engage with other leaders in the industry. And the indirect net result of that could be increased traffic because if you do the interview and you record it or if it's via video, then you can obviously post it on other platforms. And that could in turn drive traffic to your website. Obviously, just like guest blogging, it's going to increase your reach. So getting yourself out there. Nobody knows who your brand is and they know who the thought leaders are and they see you interviewing the thought leaders, then that's going to put you in front of these people. And so it's going to increase your reach. Another way to drive traffic to your website is just to make sure your website's responsive. And what do we mean by responsive? Well, we mean, does it work on multiple devices? specifically mobile. So depending on the device, your website hides, shows, shrinks, enlarges, or moves content so that it conforms to the browser that that person's looking at on your web for your website. So if somebody's looking on mobile at your website, you want to make sure that your website adjusts accordingly. So you want to be able to, you know, test to make sure it's responsive. And so is content arranged based on importance. Okay, does it work across different browsers on different devices? And do the images, text, and everything else align just like it does on desktop? So there are plenty of tools out there on the web. All you need to do is just do a search for, you know, check my website for responsiveness. 
you know, so you, you can use plenty of tools to check to see if your website is responsive towards multiple devices. Why is that important? Because if somebody goes to your website via mobile and your site doesn't align properly or the content's all stretched out and somebody has to maneuver their browser just to see your website, then chances are they're not gonna come back. Chances are they're not gonna convert. Okay, so you want to be able to revise your device browser combinations. You want to make sure that everything works accordingly. You want to be able to test those fonts, make sure they look good. And then you also want to make sure that people can navigate. So if they're on mobile, are they going to navigate just as easy as they can on desktop? And if you have any pop-ups, you want to probably make sure they're removed. So that way, when somebody's looking at your website, they're not getting interfered with on mobile and then of course you want to make sure that these pages load okay so they load just as quick on desktop as they should on mobile and vice versa so this should not take a long time to load so moving on from responsiveness on mobile to building a brand community so brand community refers to a group of people who identify your brand and use your brand as a platform to exchange ideas and contribute content some advantages of having a brand community are promoting brand evangelism and loyalty. It can be a source of feedback, loyalty, and ideas. So build a community, build a brand community who, you know, identify with you. Okay. So continue to, you know, treat these people as loyal customers. Okay. Maybe give them a promotion uh, to use specifically just for them that they can use on your website or talk directly to them because you know that they're followers, they're repeat customers, they purchase for you multiple times. So talk to them differently as well. You know who these people are. And that's what building a brand's all about. It's about identifying your brand with other people, okay? And identify people who identify with your brand and messaging and talking to them as if they're part of your own community, your own family. So you can use user generated content that provides future marketing strategies. So the feedback you get from your own community could be in turn used to promote or used in future marketing strategies, i.e. advertising, i.e. post on social. Okay, it can also provide PR opportunities. So it's a chance for you to, you know, put out press releases based on the community that you built. So any brand, regardless of who it is, should be able to identify with your audience, their target audience, and that target audience eventually going to become part of a community. These are a group of people who identify with you, what you're trying to sell, what your cause is, what your mission statement is, what your service is. They identify with you. So leverage them and reciprocate. Identify them, talk to them separately, give them the what they deserve, the respect and loyalty that they deserve as well because they're communicating and they're following you as a brand. So the next thing you could do to drive traffic is be active in the comment section. So engage in relevant and thought-provoking conversations on other blogs and sites. It doesn't necessarily have to be another blog per se. It could be other sites like Reddit or Quora or Medium. Sites that have a lot of content that are broken out by industry that allow you to engage in conversation, that allow you to either upvote or share or respond, okay? So be active because when you're active, people are gonna see that, hey, you're a leader in the industry, you know what you're talking about. You have some, some brand equity, you have some thought and some knowledge on the specific topic and subject. So it just puts you in a better light when you can respond and be active on these different platforms. Okay, let's turn our attention to search engine optimization, also known as SEO or organic search. So in order to drive traffic to your site, you're going to have to implement an SEO strategy. Why do you want to implement an SEO strategy? Because it can help you improve your overall searchability and visibility on search engines. And obviously that comes with advantages. One of those advantages is obviously more traffic to the site. Search is still king in terms of volumes of people using search on a daily basis. So you have a great opportunity to be found. It also builds trust and credibility because still a majority of the people who do a search click on an organic search listing. 
And so if you're found organically and you're ranked number one, then chances are somebody's going to click on your listing. And it provides increased engagement and traffic. And so what that means is more traffic, more engagement. And engagement is something you define. It could be, again, a download of a document or the clicking on the play button of a video or, or submitting a form or signing up for a newsletter or calling. These are all forms of engagement. So the, the amount of traffic you drive from organic search to your website is only going to improve engagement. Okay, so you can also provide an improved user experience. And what do we mean by that? Well, if you're getting lots of traffic from organic search, you have a really good opportunity to do A-B testing. And when you do A-B testing, you can improve user experience, meaning you're showing one variation against the other from people coming from organic search. And so this is helpful in that you know if you're running an A-B test, the variation has a chance to improve or outperform the original. And if it outperforms the original, you're improving user experience. And then it helps target quality traffic. So SEO to me, or all search, is the only medium in which you're meeting somebody halfway. You're, you're addressing what they're looking for. So if somebody's looking for a pair of red women's Nike shoes, the 2019 model, and you have that particular product to offer, well, you have a chance of showing up via organic search. Somebody types in, you know, women's red Nike shoes, size, whatever, at the year 2019 model, then of course they're gonna probably likely click on your listing because you have what they're looking for. And, and that goes with any keyword, any industry, any business, any segment, any type of product you're selling. So again, you have a chance to really be visible for what people are looking for. And so that's the beauty of search engine optimization. You have a really good opportunity here to meet people halfway, to drive quality traffic, to get them to enjoy a good user experience, all the while generating engagement. And along with SEO, we wanna be able to build backlinks. So SEO is a two-pronged approach, meaning you have two strategies in one, on-page and off-page. And so, off-page involves backlinking. So backlinks are just links that direct users from other websites to your own website. So with that, inherently, it's gonna drive traffic, qualify traffic to your website. Because if somebody's on a relevant website that's linking to yours, and they click on that link and go to your website, it's likely going to be qualified, meaning they're gonna be relevant. And so backlinking, because it's an off-page strategy, why is it an off-page SEO strategy? Because if Google crawls that other site that has a link to you, then that's gonna give you credit because Google will say, hey, this site's getting some links from some relevant sites, we must think they're relevant and therefore we're going to trust this site. So by Google trusting your site, it's going to improve your organic ranking. And with the organic rankings being improved, meaning it's going to mean faster indexing. So what does that mean? So you wanna be indexed by the search engines and so the quicker Google can find your pages, even if it's on somebody else's site, then that means they're gonna follow that link, go to that page on your site, and take that page back to their servers to be indexed, okay? So the quicker you can get indexed, the quicker you can get found. And then it helps with referral traffic. So again, we noticed that our efforts are on SEO, organic search, but if you're getting traffic from another website, hey, that still counts. That's referral traffic, okay? So that's a side advantage to having backlinks is good traffic from other sites. Okay, so those those are inherently the some of the reasons to do backlinking. Okay, never hurts. I mean, there's brand awareness reasons to being on other sites as well. There's industry leadership, meaning if you 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 post content on Reddit, okay, you're coming across as an industry leader, but yet generating a backlink, which helps with SEO and referral traffic. So there's a lot of benefits to building backlinks. And the opposite of backlinks are internal links. So you want to do internal linking, and that just means connecting one page on your site to another. And why is that beneficial? Because it can help direct visitors to other pages they wouldn't normally otherwise find via your navigation. So if you're active on a blog, don't be afraid to include multiple internal links. 
You want to move people through your site. You want the flow of traffic to go from one page to another to another. And so when you do internal linking, just like with backlinks, it's going to improve the indexing of your website. Google's going to follow those links and index those pages. And Google does give credit from an SEO perspective, from an internal linking perspective. So if one page is linked to another and that page has really good relevance in the eyes of Google, then the other page is probably gonna benefit from that. The other reason you wanna do internal linking, again, you wanna move people from your one page of your site to the other. And when you do that, it's gonna reduce bounce rates. So bounce rate is simply the rate at which people land on a page and then leave. So if I have 100 people land on my homepage and only one person went to another page and the other 99 left the site, then that's a 99% bounce rate. So by putting internal links in place, you're helping people move from one page to the other and thus reducing the bounce rate. And that's what you want. You want to keep people on your site. You want to be greedy. It also drives traffic to older posts. So again, when we say older posts, we're really referring to blog posts. So if you have a relevant blog post and you're writing a new blog post, then link the two together. If it's relevant, link it. I don't, you know, regardless of how old it is, you know, you want to show Google that these older blog posts, just because they were written a year ago, doesn't mean they're outdated and old fashioned, okay, or useless. You want to keep them alive by linking to them. So to me, that's a good strategy for internal linking link to older blog posts, you know, show people you're an industry expert. You've been doing this for a while and then you have lots of content to share. Okay. So the longer you can keep somebody on your website, the more likely it is they're going to engage and convert and some other inherent benefits improves page rank. So what we mean by page rank is simply just a rank that Google gives pages. So the more internal linking you have, the better off you are. And then it helps spread link juice across websites. And what we mean by link juice again, just like backlinking, it builds relevancy. So just keep all these inherent benefits in mind to internal linking. The end result is keeping the flow of traffic on your site and all these other benefits will fall into place. Okay. So, Another way in which you can really hone in on traffic to your website is long tail keywords. And long tail keywords to me are more than just one or two keyword phrases. Okay, so they're usually three or longer keywords in a phrase. Okay, so long tail keywords really nowadays account for most web searches. People really take the time to even post questions as a search query. They so likely somebody, it's unlikely somebody's going to go into search and just type in the word shoes. They might type in red shoes, but that's unlikely. What they're probably going to type in is, you know, red Nike running shoes 2019 or some variation of that. Okay. That's a long tail keyword. And some of the advantages of using long tail keywords to be found for are less competition. So if you're using broad keywords like red shoes, then who doesn't want to be found for red shoes? Well, you don't necessarily, you don't want to be found for red shoes because it's too broad. You don't know what type of shoes somebody's looking for. You just know they're looking for red shoes. It could be running shoes. It could be work shoes. It could be, you know, boots. It could be slippers. Okay. It's too broad. So long tail keywords help narrow it in. And the more narrow and focused a keyword is, the less competition is going to have. And when something's not competitive in the form of a keyword, then that means your chances of ranking for that keyword are going to be greater and the chances of you ranking faster are going to be greater. And then of course, if somebody's looking for exactly what you have to offer, then you have a higher chance to convert that person. So if you have exactly those 2019 red Nike women's running shoes and somebody does a search for that and that's a long tail keyword and they click on your organic listing, if you have the right price, then they're probably going to convert. So you have a really good chance of converting somebody using long tail keywords. So my point here is if you're looking for keywords to use, focus on longer tail. Don't focus on one or two keyword phrases. What it also does is it brings targeted traffic. So even if somebody doesn't convert, hey, they could be back because it's exactly what they're looking for. And if you're focusing on longer tail keywords, like I just mentioned, stay away from the shorter ones. It's just easier to optimize your page for SEO. So remember, SEO is a two pronged approach on page and off page. We talked about off page with internal linking and backlinks on page is all about making sure those keywords you choose are integrated in with the page you want to be found for. 
And so if you're using a long tail keyword, it's just easy to work that keyword in. So it enables easier on-page optimization. Okay, let's switch away from SEO to email marketing. So let's focus on email marketing as a form or method of driving traffic to your website. So email marketing has been around a long time in terms of digital marketing. Why? Because it provides an effective way to convert leads into sales. Why? Because you can send personalized emails to a target audience. So when you send an email to somebody on a regular basis, you know who that person is. So what are you doing in the email? You're writing a specific message to that person. Well, email marketing is the same thing, except you're just sending an email to a larger group of people. And when you send an email to a larger group of people, you're still going to personalize the message, right? You're not going to send a generic email to 1,000 people. Okay, nobody's going to do that. So make sure your email is targeted. And if it's targeted, it can be cost effective. Why? Because sending large amounts of emails, or let's just say an email to a large amount of people or a large group of people, is going to be cost effective. It's not cost per click. You know, it's not cost per open. Okay, so email usually, depending on the, the email provider you're using, really is a flat fee. So it just really depends on how many emails you're sending or how, how many people you're sending the email to as well. So, but email generally tends to be more cost effective than other forms of marketing. So look at the email content provider you're using and just get a sense of what they charge. But if you look at it and do a comparison, email generally is cheaper than say doing pay-per-click because with pay-per-click, you're paying for each click. Okay, so that could be expensive depending on the keywords. So email marketing is also time saving, okay? Meaning it's a one-time thing and done. So once you send the email, it's just a matter of you know watching and looking at the metrics and learning what's going on so you don't make the same mistakes again but it is time conducive meaning you send out one email and that's it with pay per click you're constantly measuring and managing the campaigns and it provides real time marketing so when you do send the email more than likely a majority of the people on day 1 or the day you send the email are going to be able to view it open it click on some of the links and convert. So that's normally what happens in email. Majority of the people open it on day one and it kind of tails off from there. So think about it as real time. So when you send that email and if you have a thousand people on your email recipient list, break it up. Send the first 500 first with a different subject line. And then you can see the data come in. And if you don't see the good results from the subject line or the body of the email or you know the page you're going to, then make adjustments before you send the other email to the next 500. So that's a great thing about email is you can break up the email into two groups, the first group and then the second group with different subject lines. And you can probably send them a little bit of time apart. That way you can learn from the first email because with email, you are generally gonna get results right away. Okay, within the first 24 hours. So that's a great thing about email. Okay, so the other thing about email, it's less intrusive. So normally people who are going to get the email are the ones who sign up for the email. So they're almost expecting your email. So when they get your email, again, as long as you're not sending an email on a daily basis, normally most companies send it monthly or bi-weekly, it's not gonna be as intrusive. Okay, and then it also helps build credibility, increase visibility and brand awareness, meaning you're going to build your brand in that email. You're going to put content in that email that's going to show off your credibility, meaning you could put some testimonials in the email, you could put some good affiliations, you can put a good article to an industry article you just wrote. So email is going to inherently continue to build brand awareness for you. Okay, and it's an easy way to track ROI. So if you're e-commerce, e it's pretty clear. You send the email, somebody opens it, clicks on it, checks out and purchases something, it's easily trackable because you could track it right from that email. So one thing I wanna say there is just if you do send an email, make sure you're tracking that campaign. And you wanna be able to use an analytics program like Google Analytics. Okay, if you use Google Analytics, you're gonna be able to track when you send the email, who clicks on it, and who converts. So you wanna be able to measure an ROI for these emails, and you can, and that's the beauty of email marketing. Okay, let's move away from email marketing to webinars. So webinars, great method for effective social media promotion. 
It's a great way to bring traffic to your website. So why do we recommend webinars? Well, because it provides direct content, contact within your target group. What do we mean by contact with your target group? Well, you're gonna host a webinar and you're gonna invite this targeted group of people who are interested in your product or service. So if you have a Facebook community, you could do a Facebook Live event or you could do a YouTube or you know you can even set up a webinar on another platform but promote it on social media and if you're promoting something on social media you're probably promoting it to people who are already following you or like you and so that's what we mean by direct contact with your target group so you're you're going to be able to create a webinar and talk directly to that group and that's going to help build brand awareness and credibility and the great thing about webinars is you don't need some fancy software I mean, I'm talking to you on a webinar right now. And so webinars are free. All you need is a video camera and a recorder, that's all. And that's all built in with software. So there's plenty of software out there that allows you just to do a webinar really quick and easy. There's lots of opportunities in software. So, and a lot of them are very cost effective. So if you wanna build, uh, create a webinar, you can do that by spending very little money. And webinars, again, allow you to talk to your, your targeted group, your community, maybe prospective clients. It helps build credibility and in effect drive traffic to your website. And when somebody does attend a webinar, they're likely gonna be highly engaged because you're inviting them, they're gonna opt into the webinar. And the great thing about webinars is even if they don't attend the webinar the day you have it, it's gonna be recorded. So they can always go back and watch it. So whoever watches the webinar is going to be engaged because it's gonna be a topic they're interested in. And then users are likely to become prospective customers. So having a webinar, talking about something inherently interesting to maybe a larger group of people, you can promote that on social media and potentially get prospective customers to sign up and watch the webinar. And if you do, they're going to be engaged and then take the next step. Oh, I like what this guy, this person has to say. They seem to be credible. I like their personality. I like their brand. I like their product. I'm gonna go check their web out their website, okay? So webinars allow you to kind of pull in more people as well as just your community because you can promote the webinar and you can promote it in advance and you can leverage social media for that. Okay, so something related to webinars, incorporating video content. So videos have been proven to be a really good way to attract new visitors. And it just, it makes your website very engaging when you have videos on your website as well. So if you create video, you have an opportunity to post it on various video platforms like YouTube or Vimeo. Okay, there's plenty of video platforms out there or just embedded in a blog post or embedded in a Facebook post or a tweet. Okay, so you can do a lot with video and having video on your site is going to increase engagement. Okay, when you increase engagement, good things happen. That's going to lead to increased conversions and sales or, or ROI or just like we mentioned the webinar can help build trust with your audience. So even that webinar you could post on your website. So you want people to engage by watching this video. If they watch the video, they're going to gain trust in you because you're talking directly to that person, that user, that audience, that visitor to your website. And when you get build trust, it's going to increase engagement. And that's the beauty of video. Unlike text or imagery, videos really do engage with the audience. And so the more video you can do, the better off you are because again, you can leverage social, to draw attention to your brand and product and service. And then you can have that video on your website to increase engagement, which in turn increases conversions and sales and improves ROI. So always think video, there's plenty of video software out there that you can leverage. And the great thing about video too is, hey, most people are using mobile phones these days, smartphones. And so video works just as well on mobile as it does on desktop. So keep that in mind, you know, video is going to be engaging regardless of what device somebody uses. And then of course, if they're watching the video on Facebook or YouTube, then it chances are they're going to share that particular video, which is going to bode well for your brand and traffic. 
Okay, so video, if somebody likes a video, it's very easy to share video, especially from a mobile phone. So YouTube just makes it so easy to share or like or subscribe to a channel. It just, it becomes that much easier. Things can go viral and chances of them going viral with video are gonna be greater. Okay, so other ways to drive traffic to your website is submit your content to content aggregators. So what's a content aggregator? Well, a content aggregator is like Reddit that provides a great platform for you to post your content. So that's what a content aggregator is, really a site like Reddit or Medium or Quora where you could post content to a large number of people, okay? So with Reddit, people are either going to upvote it or downvote it. So the more upvotes you get or thumbs up or likes or people who encourage that content, the more of a chance it has to be found. And so first thing out of the gate, if you do provide content to a content aggregator like Reddit, make sure it's good quality content that's interesting. And that should be a case, the case across the board, whether it's a, a social post or a blog post, make sure the content's unique, professional, and interesting. And then if you do, say, put something on Medium or you do put something on Quora, and it is professional and interesting and thought-provoking, then people are going to react to it. And then that, again, could lead to traffic. But even if it doesn't lead to traffic, it helps build brand awareness. So if you have content, just like videos, leverage it. Put the content out there. Okay? And when you put content out there, it's only going to, especially if it's good content, put, it's going to put you in a good light. So don't be afraid to share your content on the likes of Reddit or Medium or Core or some of these other content aggregator websites because good things are only going to happen. And again, referral traffic, SEO, brand awareness, conversions. So all these are inherent benefits of just sharing your content. Okay, and then finally, we want to learn from analytics. Okay, so what do I mean learning from analytics? So there are plenty of analytics platforms out there. One of the most popular is Google Analytics. So you want to make sure you're tracking traffic on your site with Google Analytics. So all you have to do is just go to Google Analytics via search, sign up, add the analytics code to your website, and voila, they're doing all the heavy lifting. They're going to track traffic coming to your website. And not only are they going to track traffic, but they're going to tell you how that traffic engaged. And so the benefits of it, Google Analytics is, hey, you could figure out where users are coming from. Are they coming from that email campaign that I sent out to a thousand people? Are they coming from YouTube based on that video I posted? Or are they coming from Reddit based on the content I just posted there? Or are they coming from organic search? It, so Google Analytics can help us understand how much traffic we're getting from organic search. So it'll help us measure our SEO efforts. And then with Google Analytics, you could segment. So we could segment by mobile, we can segment by desktop, returning user, new user, by campaign, by page, by language, by city, by region. I mean, there's so many ways in which to segment your audience. And segmenting simply is breaking up the entire group of people who come to your website into different segments based on what you want to see. So if you want to look at, you know, females, between the ages of 18 to 24 who come from mobile via organic search. That's a segment and you can look at that information in analytics. If that's your target audience, then you could see how they're performing. Okay, so there are a lot of benefits to Google Analytics. Definitely want to take advantage of segmenting in Google Analytics. You could look at your competition. So there's a benchmarking report. The great thing about Google Analytics, you can also look at content and how your content's performing once somebody lands on your website. Are they, what page are they spending time on? What page are they engaging on the most? Okay, what pages have the highest bounce rate or the lowest time on page? So you can really determine what pages work best. And then of course the end result in analyzing all this data is you wanna be able to fine tune your website. So take advantage of the data that Google Analytics or any other analytics platform is giving you by learning. Once you learn what's going on with your website, you can make adjustments to your website to improve user experience. Okay, so we went over a lot of different ways to drive traffic. Okay, you can incorporate all this to your website immediately. So if you are looking to become an SEO professional, then look no further than Simply Learn's postgraduate program in digital marketing. 
gain in-depth knowledge of search engine optimization. With this course, you will also learn content marketing, web analytics, keyword management and research, website optimization, and much more. Unlock a whole toolbox of skills, including SE ranking, Hootsuite, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Google Ads, and Keyword Planner. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Find the course link in the description for more information. Research. Let's talk about that keyword research for a website with shoes. And, and it doesn't really matter what particular product you have. If you need to rank number one on Google, it all starts with the keywords, as I mentioned before. And so in this example, if you have a website where you sell shoes for kids, you're going to want to be found for certain keywords. So the obvious keyword here would be shoes for kids. Well, every keyword that you target has search volume associated with it. So that means when we talk about search volume, we're talking about how many people on average type in that keyword or related keyword on google.com or Google search. And there's always an average number of searches associated with every keyword. And we call that search volume. How much search volume? So obviously if we're gonna target a keyword, we wanna have as much volume as possible. However, there's always going to be competition for those keywords, meaning there's always gonna be other websites who wanna rank number one on Google for the same keywords. And we call that competition or difficulty. So for every keyword, you're going to have volume and you're going to have competition or difficulty. And the difficulty ranges as well, depending on the tool you use. And we'll get into that in a minute, but search volume is how much on average people are typing in that keyword or close variants of that keyword. And the difficulty is measured in terms of how many other websites are trying to rank for the same keyword. And so ideally, when it comes to keyword research, we wanna find that nice balance. We want high volume and we want low competition. But at the same time, we wanna focus on keywords that are highly relevant to our business. So if we're selling shoes for kids and shoes for kids is highly relevant, has high volume and low competition, then that's a keyword we wanna target. So we always wanna focus in on those three areas. So there's always a trade-off with keywords. So shoes for kids might have high volume, but also might have high competition or difficulty. If we look for another keyword that's just as relevant, for example, shoes for children, it may still have high search volume, but the competition or the difficulty may be lower. And if that's the case, then that may be a better keyword for us to target. Instead of something highly competitive like shoes for kids, we can focus on another relevant keyword like shoes for children with just as much volume and lower competition. And the reason why we want lower competition is because we want to be able to rank for that keyword. So the higher the competition, the harder it is for us to rank number one on Google for that keyword. And so the whole idea beyond keyword research is analyzing and choosing the best keywords. So we want to identify a list of keywords that are always relevant. We want to choose the keyword that your competitors are ranking for. And we want to use third party tools to choose keywords to identify which keywords have low competition and what keywords have high search volume. So one thing to take into consideration when you're doing keyword research is that the longer the keyword phrase, or in other words, long tail keywords or keywords with three keywords in the phrase or more, you're gonna always have less competition, but there's always a trade-off. With long tail keywords, meaning the longer the keyword phrase, there's gonna be less volume, but the trade-off is less competition. And so what we wanna do is we wanna brainstorm some ideas and find those relevant keywords. So let's look at an example here. So if we go to Google Ads, so Google Ads has a tool called Keyword Planner. And let's just say I have a, a website where I'm selling dried figs. And if I'm selling dried figs, I want people to buy these dried figs. However, in order to attract them, I wanna be able to show them that, hey, we have a, a bunch of recipes. And if I show you a bunch of recipes where you can use dried figs, maybe you'll buy these dried figs to use in these recipes. And so we're gonna look for 
keywords related to bread recipes because if we can optimize for our recipes page for bread then that will attract an audience who wants to make bread and use dried figs with those bread recipes so that's the example I'm going to give here and so if I look at the keyword planner in Google Ads if I just type in bread recipes what Google is going to do is they're going to give me an average monthly search volume so I can see the average monthly search volume here is 60,500 and so in order to do keyword research what I would recommend is keep a spreadsheet and so the idea behind the spreadsheet is to document the volume and the competition you're getting for certain keywords so if I go into a spreadsheet here my theme of keywords is bread recipes my keyword is bread recipes and my volume therefore is going to be 60,500 however if I go back into Google Google's keyword planner Google's telling me the competition is low so that's great I want high volume I want low competition but how low is low so we want to be careful so if we're going to put in numbers into a spreadsheet we want to figure out what that competition really is for the keyword bread recipes so if I go to Google and just type in bread recipes I'm gonna be able to see 771 billion results for the keyword bread recipes now, is 771 billion our real competition? Maybe, maybe not. What we want to do is put in a syntax, and we want to put in the syntax all in title, and then colon, space, and then our keyword. And the reason why we do that in search is because we want to be able to identify the true competitive number, or the true number of websites who are trying to rank for bread recipes. And if we put in the syntax all in title, colon, and then our keyword bread recipes, we'll be able to see that there are 998,000 results. That's a lot lower than 771 billion. So that means that 998,000 sites or listings have the keyword bread recipes in the title tag. And the title tag is what shows up in the search engine results. And so if I look down and scroll down here, I can see bread recipes are in every one of these title tags. So title tag is an important element to rank number one on Google. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes but if we understand that there are 998,000 results with bread recipes in the title tag then this tells us that those are the websites who are trying to rank number one on Google for that keyword and therefore those are the websites we need to jump over in order for our website to rank number one on Google and so therefore I'm gonna put in 998,000 in my spreadsheet as the competitive number and so now I could see for the keyword bread recipes I have 60,500 and if my comp competition is 998,000 then my KEI or keyword effectiveness index or in other words the ratio of volume to competition is 6% so that's nothing more than volume divided by competition so that tells me that my KEI or my ratio between volume and competition is 6% so remember we want more more volume than we want competition so anytime you do a keyword research you're going to find a number of different relevant keywords so if I go back into Google's keyword planner if I typed in bread recipes you could see that Google is going to give me a number of different keywords related to bread recipes let's just say I have another keyword that I want to think about optimizing for or being ranked on Google for and that's banana bread recipe very similar keyword as bread recipes except it's a little longer tail now if I type in banana bread recipe in Google's keyword planner now I can see the average monthly search volume has actually gone up it's 368,000 I can also see the competition is low so those are good signs so now I can see 368,000. I'm gonna go ahead and put that in my spreadsheet. Now I'm gonna go into Google. I'm gonna put in my syntax all in title. I'm gonna put in banana bread recipe. I'm gonna hit enter. And now I can see I have 233,000 results with the keyword banana bread recipe in the title tag. So if I look at the title tags, I can see banana bread recipe, banana bread recipe, 
banana bread recipe on all the listings in the Google search results. So that tells me I have 233,000 results that I have to jump over in order to rank number one on Google. So I'm gonna put 233,000 in my spreadsheet. Now I can see my KEI or my volume to competition ratio is 157, 158%. And so to me, that's a lot better number to work with, or in other words, that's a lot better keyword because it's just as relevant and it has a higher ratio of volume to competition. So therefore, banana bread recipe is going to be a better keyword to optimize for in order to rank number one on Google. So that's the whole idea behind keyword research. You wanna brainstorm ideas. There are plenty of tools out there. So the tool I recommend is Google Ads Keyword Planner. Google's gonna give you how much search volume. They're gonna tell you the competition, but then you're gonna go into Google search. You're gonna use the syntax all in title to get a more accurate read on the actual competitive number. And so to find out how keywords that your competitors are ranking for, you can use those keyword tools that I mentioned. Another tool that I use is Moz. So Moz, if you go to moz.com, they have a tool called Keyword Explorer. So if we just type in the keyword, for example, bread recipes, it's gonna be able to tell us how much volume and the difficulty. So you can use other tools at your disposal, figure out the volume and the difficulty. There are plenty of tools out there. But the one thing I would just make sure is you use everything at your disposal. So you can use social media to find the most shared article for a particular topic or keyword like bread recipes. You could check other platforms that have a lot of shared content like Reddit and Quora, where you can ask people about certain topics using keywords to figure out how much competition or volume there might be. You could stay up to date on industry news to get an idea of what types of keywords are trending. But when it comes to keywords and keyword research, remember for every web page, we wanna be able to pick two keywords. We want a primary and secondary keyword. Word. So when we do keyword research and we enter all our keywords into our spreadsheet, we want to be able to have a number of different keywords. In this case, we're focusing on the theme bread recipes. We want to have different keywords because we want to be able to choose a primary keyword and a secondary keyword because we want to be able to focus on multiple keywords for each page because we don't want to put necessarily all our eggs in one basket, meaning we won't want to put all our emphasis just on one keyword to rank for. We want multiple keywords to try and rank for. So the primary keyword can define the nature of our business. The secondary keyword could be just highly relevant to our keyword. At the end of the day, we want to choose multiple keywords to try and rank on Google for that page. So for example, we have a blog and we're using ice cream recipes and we're blogging about ice cream recipes, we can have a primary keyword that is about ice cream recipes or homemade ice cream recipes. We're gonna always wanna find out what the volume and the competition is. Our secondary keyword could be built around other similar keywords like low-fat ice cream recipes or fat-free ice cream recipes or low-fat homemade ice cream recipes. Those are complementary keywords, just like our bread recipes and banana bread recipe. So one thing we wanna do when we do keyword research is we wanna be able to target one keyword per content when you can target many. We wanna be able to target multiple keywords, not necessarily target one keyword. And so we wanna be able to cluster keywords. So we don't wanna target just one, we wanna target multiple keywords per page. And when we talk about clustering, if we go back to our keyword research, what we're doing is we're clustering a bunch of keywords under the theme bread recipes. And so by looking at the volume, looking at the competition, looking at the KEI, we can choose different keywords for our page. And that's what we mean by clustering. We wanna cluster keywords into a content theme. So why target only one keyword per content when we can target many? Because we don't wanna put all our eggs in one basket. We don't wanna target just one keyword. We wanna target many. And so that means clustering your keywords into a theme and choosing 
multiple keywords for that particular page. And when we do that, we have a better opportunity to rank high on Google search. And the whole idea behind ranking high on Google search is we can get the volume. So if we know we're ranked number one on Google search for bread recipes or banana bread recipe, we know we stand a chance of getting a majority of the volume associated with that keyword. And if we can get the volume and get the traffic, then we can get the conversions. So let's move on to high quality content and talk about the impact content has on your ability to get your website ranked number one on Google. So let's just say you have content on your website and the content is ranking on you know, page four of Google and it's that blog with ice cream recipes. And if it's just content for the sake of content, it's not really informative, then it's not necessarily gonna get good engagement. In the eyes of Google, you know, they wanna rank content that's very informative, it's very fresh, it's exciting to read, it's interesting, it's going to have good engagement. So if it's a recipe or an article about any topic, if it's the content is just not informative, then you're not gonna get good engagement. And when you don't get good engagement, if people don't stay on the site, to engage in the content and they just leave the website after landing on the page, causing a bounce, then the content's just gonna continue to fall down the rankings. And we wanna prevent that. We wanna move up the rankings. We wanna be number one on Google. We don't necessarily want to fall in the rankings for our content. So content is a key driver in being able to rank number one on Google. So if the content is on page nine, what can we do? Well, we want to be able to, you know, take that content and do something with it. We feel like we did write engaging content, so let's go ahead and share it on social media. And to me, social media is a good platform to share your content because on social media platforms like Facebook, for example, you're building a community on that platform. That community is already interested in your content. So if you're sharing an ice cream recipe, especially in the summertime, and you're engaging with your community on that platform, then the likelihood of that community on that platform is going to increase engagement. Increased engagement will send social signals to the search engine that says, hey, this content is good quality. Likewise, for any other platform, most social media platforms have engagement metrics and those engagement metrics pass signals. Is it good, is it not good? Do we like this content? Are we giving it a thumbs up? Are we gonna wanna follow it? Are we gonna wanna share it? And so if you share content that you feel is engaging on social platforms, then it's gonna be engaging and it's likely going to cause an increase in engagement, for example, a decrease in bounces. Mm -hmm. And once you share that quality content, then the likelihood of it moving up the rankings, even as far as number one on Google, is gonna be greater. So you always want to start out writing good quality content. So let's talk about good quality content because Google does take content seriously. They do take into account what other people think of that content. So high quality content is an important factor. So how to create good content? That's always the question. So let's talk about some best practices here. Remember, in the last segment, we talked about keyword research. So we want to perform good keyword research. Why? Because we want to choose keywords. Remember, we're choosing multiple keywords per page. One keyword could be related to our brand. One keyword could be related to the content, but another keyword could be related to a user's intent, like recipes. If you recall the example we use with bread recipes, maybe somebody's looking to type in a keyword that says, how do I make you know, a bread? Or how do I make a specific type of bread? Or how do I make banana bread? Or what's the best recipe for banana bread? They're question related. And we wanna be able to answer those questions. So that's where choosing those right keywords that's going to respond to a user's intent. So starts with choosing the right keywords. So. Remember, we talked about a number of different tools when we talked about keyword research. So there's a research tool that you can use called phrase.io, and that will help you do quick research on you know, keywords and trends and whatnot. So 
If you know a better research tool that you use for keyword research, then drop us a comment below. I'd be interested in getting your comments about keyword research and what research tools are out there. So if you know something better than phrase.io, drop a comment below and we'd be interested in getting your perspective. So keyword research is key but creating content that fulfills users requirements. So answering those questions. If it's a recipe, we want to answer that question. If it's directions, we want to answer that question. If they don't know how to do something, we want to answer that question. And that's the whole idea behind content. Content is not just to fill a page. It's to really fulfill users requirements. That's when you get good engagement. So if somebody's typing in something on Google and they're looking for an answer, your content should answer that question. But we also want to make the content readable. So in other words, you know, write for your audience. Don't impress anybody with very high vocabulary type words that somebody doesn't necessarily know the meaning of. Don't use jargon. Don't use a street language, for example. Use everyday common language that's just easily digestible when your audience is reading. And then we want to keep that content organized. And so when we mean organized, we want to use headers and subheaders. You know, break your content into paragraphs. Keep the flow organized. If we can keep the flow organized, then it's going to be easier for somebody to read. And then it's okay to add resources, especially resources from credible sites. So if you can incorporate those resources in there, then it's just going to add the credibility to your content. Let the audience know that, hey, I've done my research on this topic, and this is what this person has to say about it. This person who seems to be credible. Okay, so it only adds value to your content. So these are all tips to remember when creating content. And then the one important tip here is we want to use white hat techniques. And when we say white hat techniques, that means, you know, if we've chosen keywords that are going to answer somebody's question, we don't want to stuff those keywords into the content. We want the content to be naturally written. So when we say opt for white hat uh, techniques, that's what we mean. Write the content naturally. Keep it organized, keep it readable, include third party sources, and make sure it answers a question. So there are different types of content. So there's content where you just write words, it's all text based. You could also use an infographic. An infographic is simply just a graphic that visualizes exactly what you're trying to explain. For example, if we want to write an article about how to write good engaging content, we don't necessarily have to write all that out as a text. We can create an infographic. So for example, here's an infographic on 20 effective ways to basically not bore your readers, but write engaging content. So you could see this is an infographic. It's all graphically laid out. So infographics tend to be easier to understand because they're visual. They're easy for the end user to comprehend because there's generally no jargon. It's usually images that are portraying the point of what you're trying to get across. And so it tends to break it up, the monotony of just text. It's more visually appealing and it's laid out and organized. So you can see this infographic has 20 different steps or rules and they lay those out all here in this infographic. And the great thing I like about infographics is you could, you could share them on social media. You can re-engage them as a post. You could save them on really any social platform. So infographics tend to tell a better story versus say just writing text. You can use video and images. So you don't necessarily have to lay it all out in an infographic. You can certainly insert a video or an image into your content, especially if it's a blog post. If it's a blog post, then sometimes video and images on its own tell the story. You don't necessarily need text to go ahead and tell your story. A video or an image, as they say, tells a thousand words. And so images and videos are great to use in a blog post. So using different forms of content, you know, you always want to review your content. When a user dwells on your web page for a longer time, Google will tend to think, okay, this person's engaged, so we're going to rank that favorably. So if you're using infographics, videos, and images, then the chances of somebody being more engaged are going to increase versus just text that's not well organized and written out in a way that somebody doesn't necessarily understand. 
So be creative in the types of content you use. So longer engaging content tends to bode well with search engines. So this is according to HubSpot. So the more word count you use, the more words you use, the chances of you ranking higher are gonna be better. Just take into account best practices. You wanna maybe break up the content with an image, organize it, make it engaging, use headers. So it's not necessarily just words, it's the words and how those words are written, how they're structured, the types of keywords you're using, how you're engaging with your audience. There's a lot of factors, again, as best practices we just went over. But the key is, you know, if you have longer, more engaging content, then it's gonna bode better for you on search engines. So a couple of steps to create high quality content. So you wanna begin with a comprehensive introduction. So always introduce your content. Remember the content should be relevant to the keywords. So if you're choosing keywords in your keyword research, think about answering that question. If somebody's typing in bread recipes, maybe they're looking for banana bread recipes. How to make the best banana bread or how to make banana bread using dried figs. We wanna be able to align our content with that keyword naturally. You wanna create a title that's worthy, that's click worthy. So remember, if you're in Google search and you're doing search for something simple like bread recipes, we wanna make something that's gonna be you know, engaging for somebody to click on, like easy, perfect yeast bread or easy, crusty French bread or something that's gonna be engaging. You know, the best bread recipes or how to make the best homemade bread. You know, something that's going to draw somebody's attention to the title of that blog post. So we want to include LSI keywords. So what I mean by LSI keywords in your content, we mean, you know, long tail keywords, make it natural. Headings and subheadings should consist of keywords and variants. So if you're writing headers, and subheaders include the keyword in there and that way the, the content always stays relevant to the audience okay shorten your sentences and paragraphs so don't write long paragraphs remember we want to break this up we want to make it easy for the end user to read and we want to always put internal links on our blog post why because if we have internal links, then if we have a link from one blog post to another blog post or say our blog post to an internal page on our website, we want to make sure that it's relevant content. That way, if somebody is reading something and you have an internal link, let's just say from a bread recipes page to a banana bread recipes page, then they may find it interesting, click on that link and go to the banana bread recipes page. So it's keeping somebody engaged on your website. So putting in internal linking will help keep the, the end user engaged because you're offering up links that's relevant to the content. You always wanna break up that content with images, okay? We wanna use alt tags, meaning we want to pen the image with text so that way if the image doesn't load then at least the alt text will load so we can incorporate call out boxes and more importantly we want to update our content regularly so we always want to get the best recipe out there if it's banana bread or different ways to create banana bread or always just coming up with ways to update the content so we want to keep our content our blog post fresh and then we want to include a CTA, a call to action. If we include a call to action, then that's going to keep somebody engaged and have them act on your content. So these are steps to creating high quality content. And so let's look at an example here. And this is a three month old post on Buzzfeed. And it, it's 21 pictures that restore your faith in humanity. So it has a lot of likes, a lot of tweaks, and that means it's engaged. People are engaged when reading that. And so if we go and look at it as an example, we could see it on BuzzFeed here, 21 pictures that will restore your faith in humanity. So this was written back in 2012. Again, a lot of engagement. But if we look at it, we can see immediately that it's taking into account third party sources. It's got some content, it's got images, it's being broken up by images. We could see there's call to actions on there in the form of social so people can go ahead and go ahead and share it if they like it, okay? It includes videos, it includes images, 
third party sources. So it's a good post because listen, you know, it's engaging content. It's probably answering somebody's question about humanity. And we could see clearly that, look, you know, there's a lot of different examples here from a lot of different sources and we could take action on this content. So not just video, not just images, but text as well. And so it's very engaging, answers questions, takes into account the different types of content available. So this is a good post in that regard. So content's updated regularly, it's engaging, and it includes sources from high authority websites. Some do's and don'ts on the content. So take into account the best practices I mentioned about creating high quality content. Okay. Answer those questions that the end user wants to hear, you know, because that likely is going to be their search. And so you want to be able to respond to the end user. That's part of creating high quality content. Different types of content, i.e. in the form of infographics or videos or text or images. You can add images from public domain sites. You can be relatable and use examples to clarify points, just like the BuzzFeed article. Simplify complex words. Don't use sophisticated language. Talk to your audience as if you they were standing right in front of you. And use bullet points to exemplify your examples, your points. So some do's, the don'ts. Obviously, don't lift content. We don't want to lift content from another website. So that's plagiarism. So we want to have our own unique content. We also don't want to take images from other websites. And so if you do happen to find an image that works for your post and it's on somebody else's website, ideally that's not a good situation. But if you do happen to do that, then always give credit to the website. Okay, so if you took it from xyz.com, credit xyz.com for the image. And even put a link back. But ideally, you don't want to take images from other websites. Just as much as you don't want to take copy, you don't want to take images. Use your own imagery and content. But if you don't have imagery, then you can always go to stock photography. There are plenty of websites out there where you can sign up for a subscription like uh, Adobe Stock Images as an example. You can sign up for an account and in some cases you can sign up for a free account and use stock imagery. Okay, don't give less information to your audience. Give your audience what they deserve, which is the information they're looking for. They're looking for the best banana bread recipes. Give them the best banana bread recipes. Incorporate your own images. Break it up with titles. Give them a good quality piece of content that they're going to be able to engage with. And so if you put long paragraphs in your content, then it's going to be less engaging. So try to avoid those long paragraphs. Remember, shorten up the paragraphs, keep the language simple, add in images, answer those questions, use third party credible sources, but write it in your own words and you should be on your way to creating good quality content. Okay, so now that we've talked about high quality content in order to get your pages ranked high on Google search, let's turn our attention to optimizing on page elements and discuss some website level factors that are both going to help you rank high on Google search. So let's just do an overview of what we're talking about when we talk about on page elements and website level factors. So optimizing on page elements include a number of different things. But primarily, we're going to focus in on meta tags, also known as meta description tags, header tags, also known as title tags, and URLs. So those are just some of the on-page elements we want to be able to optimize using relevant keywords in order to rank high in Google search. We also want to take a look at some website factors that will affect our ranking on Google search. They include website architecture having a secure website, having a sitemap, and taking a look at page speed. So all of those are some of the website factors we need to take into account in order to rank high on Google search. So title tag and meta description together are considered meta tags. So both play an important role in ranking high on Google. So we want to be able to write unique title and descriptions for each page on our website. When I say unique, that means the title and the meta description need to be different for every page on the website. 
And so if you're not quite sure what a title tag and a meta description tag is, if you go to search and just type in any particular search query, the title tag is what's going to show up here in bold. And then the description is going to show up below it, below the URL, and that's going to describe the page. So both of these meta tags are important because it describes what your page is all about. And that's what Google uses in the search results pages. So we want to be able to pay attention to the length of our meta tags. So if we go back to our search results pages, met title tags are generally 60, 65 characters. Meta description tags are generally 160 characters. So anything really longer than that, then what's going to happen is the meta description tag or the title tag will get truncated. And so if we look here, for example, we can see all of the title tags here fit the 65 character limit. But if you run over the character count on meta description, then Google is going to truncate the copy. So you want to stay within your parameters in order to avoid getting your content truncated. And so the other thing when we're writing title meta description tags, we want to minimize keyword repetition. So if we're optimizing for keyword, we don't want to necessarily just plug that keyword into the title tag and meta description multiple times. We want to make sure our title tags and meta descriptions are naturally written. So if somebody's typing for banana bread recipe with dried figs, you know, we want to have a nice title tag and a description that is going to get somebody to respond uh, based on their need. And so we definitely want to avoid keyword repetition, but we want to be able to use that keyword in the title tag. Because if you remember from the earlier segment, when we did the all in title syntax to find out exactly how many competitors were using that particular keyword, well, we obviously want to use that keyword in the title tag because again, the title tag is an important factor when it comes to search engine results. So we want to use the keyword, but we want to avoid stuffing or using it repetitively in our title tag and our meta description. We want the title tag and the meta description to describe the page, sound natural, but also be engaging because the point is we want people to click on our link and go to our website from search engines. So title tags with numbers tend to result in higher click through rates. This is according to Moz. So for example, if you just put in a title tag that says learn digital marketing, well, that may work, but if you put a number in there, like five easy ways to learn digital marketing, that might get somebody to click on your link and go to your website. So having questions in your meta tags can also increase your click through rate. For example, if you just put learn the importance of first page rankings, not too bad, but again, generic. But if you put it into the form of a question, how to rank number one on Google, it's more action oriented. It's gonna get somebody to resonate with the question that they have. And that may be their query, how to rank number one on Google. And so these techniques will help you get higher click through rates. And so according to Backlinko, title tag with a keyword can improve site ranking. So remember, we wanna include that keyword in the title tag, even though we only have 65 characters, we want to include that keyword, but we want to avoid stuffing the keyword in there. We want to, again, make the title tag action oriented, maybe with a number, maybe as a question with the keyword in there once naturally. Not easy to do, but that's the beauty of SEO. If you can follow these best practices and write a good title tag, then the chances of you improving in your search results are going to be greater. So having only one H1 tag in your post is going to be good. So remember when somebody clicks on a link, so let's just say they do find a title tag engaging and they click on this, this link here and they go to that website, you know, you want to start out with having that particular H1 tag because the H1 tag, especially with the keyword in it, is going to signal to Google, hey, we're organizing our page. And because it's an H1 tag, it's important. We're structuring the page according to best practices. So having only one H1 tag in your post is definitely helpful. Having multiple tags, H tags in your post help organize the page a lot better. So we want to add that targeted keyword in that tag. 
and your header tags should be relevant to the content. So if we go back to our example of the using dried figs with banana breads, well, the title says California Fig Banana Bread. And remember the last segment when we're talking about high quality content? Well, look no further than including a video into our content. So not only will this video help keep the engagement high, but it breaks up the monotony of the page. And it's from a third party source, so it adds credibility to the page. So adding a video based on the last segment of high quality content definitely helps with ranking high on Google search. So following hierarchical structure, that means putting those H tags in there. H2 tags help break up the content. And we want to avoid repetition of H1 tags on your different web pages of your site, meaning don't just put the same H1 tag with the same keyword in it and keeping it blase. We want to make those H1 tags exciting to read, but also used appropriately to break up the content. So remember, all white hat techniques. We want to avoid hidden text. We want to avoid stuffing keywords. We want things to be natural. We don't want things to be forced. And your H1 tag should be 20 to 70 characters. Don't make long H1 tags. So if we go back to our page example, a short, sweet tag here, California fig banana bread. It's relevant to the content. It's short, sweet, and it breaks up the monotony of the content. And more importantly, and again, any content you have on the page should always answer the user's intent. Remember, people are using search to answer questions, find information. Our content should be able to answer that for them. So according to John Muller, Senior Webmaster Trends Analyst at Google, header tags would definitely help Google for rankings in the search results. So we want to use header tags. So when it comes to URLs, we want to use hyphens and avoid underscores. So if we look at this URL here, this uses hyphens, fig and banana bread. So it's all broken up with hyphens. That's a best practice. Remember, canonical URLs. A canonical URL signals to Google this is the original content. So we want to use original content. And if you have multiple sources of content out there on, say, different websites, we want want to use a canonical tag to signal to Google this is the original content please index this content and that doesn't hurt to use a favicon in URL meaning a small icon it helps to break up the monotony and help your URL stand out we can add targeted keywords in the URL so again looking at the URL here I could see we're using targeted keyword as part of the URL structure fig and banana bread and notice the h1 tag is fake banana bread. So it's all consistent and it flows naturally. URLs that are no longer existing, then we want to be able to set up a redirect for those URLs, meaning a 301 redirect is a server response for Google that says, hey, Google, this page is no longer available, but it, we permanently redirected it to this page, which is now available. So that's what a 301 redirect does. It helps signal to Google and all the other search engines that if the page is no longer there, that's fine. You're just gonna go to this page. This is the page that's permanently there now. And another thing we wanna do here is if you have mobile URLs, you wanna include those in the sitemap. And we're gonna hit on that in just a minute, but all URLs should be mobile friendly as well as desktop friendly, meaning take into account those best practices. Keep your URLs short, use hyphens, put the keyword in that URL, and make it easy to understand. Wanna avoid capital letters in the URLs? The URLs are case sensitive, so go lowercase. You should always go lowercase on the URL. Readable URLs, again, the rule of thumb here is if you understand what the URL is, then Google's gonna understand what the URL is. So the shorter the URL, the easier it is to read, the easier it is to read, the better chance you have to rank high on Google search. So according to Backlink2, URLs that are shorter definitely, definitely help you rank. So we want to be able to shorten those URLs. Keep them short and sweet. Don't make them long and unreadable. So those are some on optimized ways or on page elements that help you optimize. Now we want to look at some website level factors that will help you optimize and rank high on Google search. 
So good site structure provides better crawling for search engine bots. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean having your site organized in a fashion that Google's gonna be able to find all the pages. So what do we mean by that? Create a logical hierarchy structure. So if you're selling shoes, you know, you're gonna have a home page, break the structure up into men's shoes, women's shoes, children's shoes. Then under men's shoes, you could have it by brand. It could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. On the women's side, it could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. On the child side, it could be Nike, Puma, Adidas. And so you wanna keep the structure flow in a hierarchy. So we wanna balance the amount of subcategories within each category. So the men's, if it has Nike, Puma, Adidas, the women should have Nike, Puma, Adidas. And so you want to code your site navigation in CSS or HTML, meaning we want to be able to use something that Google is going to be able to index. So most sites are built in HTML and that's what Google likes to index. They like to index something that they could take back to their servers. And then more importantly, build a comprehensive structure for internal linking. So internal links mean that if you're on a site, you should have natural links pointing to other pages on your website. So to keep the flow going and we don't want to have unnatural inbound links you always want to have natural internal links to keep the flow of the user going from one page to the other so here I could see as an example all the ingredients in this recipe well this has an internal link to another page on our site and this happens to link to a page where somebody can buy the ingredient so it's a natural internal link so John Doherty of Credo has claimed that one of the biggest changes that he can make in fixing the Credo website is architecture. So for example, in Credo, John Doherty has increased the organic sessions by 74% and pages by per session by 41% just by changing the site architecture. So you'd be surprised by changing the site architecture what that will do to engagement. And so let's our, turn our attention to secure versus non-secure. So what we mean by that is is securing your site we want to make it sure that compliant with certain protocols and so if we go back here we can see that this particular site is compliant it is secure HTTPS means it has a secure license meaning the site is secure so Google likes secure versus non-secure so non-secure would be HTTP so we want HTTPS as our protocol and what that means is just enabling SSL certificates and that means when you enable an SSL certificate that means your domain or your protocol is going to be turned to HTTPS so Google prefers sites that are are secure versus non-secure so if you use HSTS as a protocol that adds an extra layer of security over the HTTPS and HSTS prevents cookie hijacking so adding multiple layers of security always helps in my opinion if you have an HTTP website a non-secure website you should look into buying an SSL certificate, getting your sites flipped over to HTTPS, because what's gonna happen is your URL structure is gonna change. When your URL structure changes, Google's gonna recognize that because they're gonna index your site. And when they index your site, they're gonna see those secure URLs. And that's gonna work favorably in your favor and help you rank higher on Google search. So websites using secure or HTTPS have a higher chance of ranking higher. So HTTPS is a ranking signal because Google indexes those pages. So let's also talk about sitemaps. So sitemap is one of the most important ways to improve your website ranking. Why? Well, because sitemaps are a way to organize all your URLs into one file. So we're basically going to a prioritize all our web pages in a sitemap so if you go to any particular website and you type in sitemap XML you're likely going to see all the pages on your website so usually the sitemap is located in the root directory so if I type in sitemap.xml I'm gonna be able to see all the pages in my root directory and I can also prioritize them I can also alert Google as to how often they change and every page is going to have a date stamp associated with it so Google can actually see how often it changes so remember we want our content to be updated frequently 
So if content's not updated frequently or it's not fresh, then Google's gonna see that site, that, that date stamp, that last modification date. So we wanna be able to make sure our content's updated frequently. We wanna let Google know that we changed it frequently. And we wanna be able to prioritize our pages, let Google know, hey, these pages are important to us. So all that can be set up in a sitemap. We want to be able to add canonical versions of URLs in the sitemap. So we want to be able to add all our original URLs in our sitemap. And so we always want to build dynamic URLs sitemaps for larger websites. And what I mean by dynamic URLs, that means that if I look at this sitemap and we're always adding content, let's just say in the form of a blog, well, guess what? We want those pages to be added to the sitemap as they're published. So as we add pages to the blog or to the site, then they should automatically be added to the sitemap. And so in effect, what's gonna happen is we're gonna be able to see the sitemap grow with more URLs. When the sitemap grows with more URLs, then that means then Google's gonna index more pages. They're gonna index more fresh pages. So they're gonna be able to get those pages that are just published quicker. So that's the whole idea behind dynamic sitemaps is we wanna be able to capture all the URLs just as they're published. And we wanna be able to maintain our sitemaps. And so I would always recommend a dynamic sitemap, but you can always create your own sitemap just by going to a tool called XML sitemap. So if I just type in XML sitemaps into Google search, here I could see XML sitemaps generator, and I can be able, if I have a small website, just create a free and simple sitemap on my own. When XML sitemaps creates it, or your platform creates a dynamic sitemap, either way, the sitemap's going to sit in the root directory, and then what we wanna do in turn is let Google know where that sitemap is. So in Search Console, we wanna be able to submit the sitemap. So you're gonna add the sitemap, you're gonna let Google know where it is, it should be in the root directory, and it should be called sitemap.xml, and when you do that, Google's gonna be able to take those URLs and index them. So we could see we submitted 528 URLs, Google indexed 521. So one thing about URLs here is when we create a sitemap, we're putting all our URLs in there, we do not add no index URLs in your sitemap. And what that means is that any URL we don't want Google to index, we're just going to exclude from the sitemap, okay? So we want Google to take all the URLs we want indexed and put them in the sitemap. So according to Edgy, using sitemaps for SEO can increase your website's visibility and help you get indexed. Why? Because what you're in effect doing is taking all your URLs that you want indexed, you're telling Google how often they're modified, you're telling Google which ones are important, and you're submitting that to Google. And so Google's gonna be able to take all these URLs quicker, index them quicker, and when they're indexed quicker, you can get ranked quicker. And when you get ranked quicker, you can get traffic quicker. So that's the whole idea behind sitemaps. So let's turn our attention to page speed now. So one of the last factors for our website, besides architecture, making it secure, and adding sitemaps, is we wanna take a look at how quick our pages load. Here are some tips in order to optimize page speed because ideally the quicker a page loads, the more engaged the user is going to be. If it takes a longer time for the page to load all the elements of that page, then what's going to happen is the user is going to get impatient, maybe leave the website altogether or go to another page. And so we want to be able to optimize images. So any image that's of large size in terms of megabytes, we want to be able to optimize that can compress the image. So that's one way to speed up page speed. We want to use a simple website design, you know, HTML with CSS or cascading style sheets. Just a simple design with simple a hierarchy and website navigation structure. So nothing fancy, nothing complex, just a simple website design with optimized images. We want to leverage browser caching and we want to upgrade the server response time, meaning all your files are sitting on the server. So when somebody goes to a web page, the server is serving up all of those files, the images, the text, etc. And so we want the server to respond as quick as possible. So when it comes to page speed, we can look at the factors affecting page speed in Google Analytics. So if I go to Google Analytics, 
and I go under behavior and I go under site speed and I go to overview, I'm going to be able to see what my average load time is for my site. And ideally, we want our pages to load as quick as possible. So that means anything under four seconds, anything four seconds or higher, and it's likely the end user is going to leave the page. There's a correlation be between page load time and bounce rate. And so what Google actually does is give you speed suggestions. So if we do have a page that loads slow, we can just go to speed suggestions in Google Analytics. And we go to speed suggestions, then Google's going to be able to tell us, hey, this particular page load fast, this particular page loads slow. And if it loaded slow, why is it loading slow? So here we could see the home page as an example is loading on average of seven seconds. Well, if we look here, they're going to give us some suggestions. So if I click on this page speed suggestions, it's going to load a report and a tool called PageSpeed Insights. And basically what it's then going to do after it's done running is it's going to tell me all the ways in which I can optimize my pages, not only for desktop, but also for mobile. So here I could see for desktop or for mobile, I can look at some ways in which I can optimize it to increase page speed. For example, sizing my images properly, server response time, reducing my server response time, avoiding multiple page redirects. So there's a lot of opportunities that we can do to speed up page load time. And all that's found in Page Speed Insights and all that's found within Google Analytics. So remember, optimizing code, minimizing redirects, optimizing your images, upgrading your server response, and all of those are factors. And so again, you can go into analytics, page speed insights, and you can see exactly what Google is recognizing as what's lowering or slowing down your page load time. So Google takes site speed as one of the most important ranking factors. Why? Because they're going to rank pages, not only with high quality content, that are relevant to the keyword queries, but they want those pages to have a good user experience. So if somebody clicks on the page, then the user should be able to see that content fairly quickly. And so that's why it's such an important factor. So the quicker your pages load, the chances of you ranking higher are gonna be better. So according to Web Performance Today, Walmart, as an example, experienced a decline in conversions. So what they did was looked at their page speed. And when they looked at their page speed, you'd be surprised what that did. Just increasing it from one to four seconds or decreasing it basically increased conversion. So there's always gonna be a correlation between how quick a page loads and how engaged the user is. Because if a user is engaged, they're gonna stay on the site. And if they stay on the site, then their chances of converting are gonna be higher. So just even one to two seconds increase in page load, load time will make a world of difference in terms of engagement and conversions. Let's turn our attention to offsite engagement. So previously we talked about on-page elements and website factors that affect our rankings for search results, but we also need to turn our attention away from our website, meaning what we do on our website, and turn our attention what we can do for our website off our website and onto other websites. So that's off-site engagement. And so let's look at an example. So that ice cream recipes blog. So we did everything we possibly could. We updated the meta tags, the title tag, the meta description. We added H1 tags. We've made sure the site architecture was sound. We submitted a site map. We, we made sure the page load was good and fast. So we did all the things we we're supposed to do on our web page, but we're still not ranking. Well, what do we need to do? Well, we need to turn our attention away from our website into other websites. We call this off-site or off-page SEO. And we need to basically generate links from high quality sites back to our site. So if we've done everything we can on our own website and we're still not ranking where we want to be, well, then we need to turn our attention to other websites. And so if we turn our attention to other websites and other websites that are relevant, other websites that are of quality, other websites that have high domain authority, then we're going to see an increase in rankings. So it's just a matter of getting quality links from quality websites that are relevant. 
That's what's going to move the needle on search after we've taken care of all the on-page elements. So more backlinks from high domain authority results in higher rankings. SEO is a combination between what we do on our website, meaning optimizing the page and making sure our website has good site architecture and follows the best practices in terms of site maps and page load. Then we need to turn our attention to the backlinking to improve our domain authority. So according to Backlinko, analysis off-site engagement is one of the most important elements for ranking number one in Google. So you can't just focus your attention on updating the title tag and making sure the pages load fast. You have to turn your attention as well to getting back links from high quality sites. That's off-site engagement. And so gaining links, back links from multiple domains is vital. It's vital because they bring referring traffic to your site. They bring credibility to your site. But more importantly, Google's gonna recognize the relationship between these sites and your website. And if these sites that have backlinks or links pointing to your site, and if they're of high quality, then we call that passing link juice. So it's going to bring quality to you in terms of organic search. So if we look at an example, if I do a search for banana bread recipe, there are 241 billion results for banana bread recipe. Why did this particular page from Simply Recipes rank number one? Well, we can turn our attention to Moz, and Moz has a report called Link Explorer, and so Moz Link Explorer report helps us identify our own page authority, our own domain authority, and how many links we have from other quality websites. So if I put that particular URL into Link Explorer, and notice the URL here is short, even though it uses an underscore when it should use a hyphen, it's still ranked number one. And why? Because off-page elements help this page rank number one. Why? Their page authority out of 100 is 58. Their domain authority out of 100 is 82. And what does that mean? Well, that means that they have a lot of good links from other domains of high quality. They have 824 linking domains to this one domain. They have 3,600 inbound links. And they're ranking for a lot of different keywords. So if we scroll down, we're gonna be able to see kind of a breakout the quality of websites that are linking to them. So they have 19 domains with a domain authority of 91 to 100 linking to them. They have 15 domains between the range of 81 and 90. So what does that tell me between 15 and 19? That's 34 particular domains that are very high quality linking to them. And so we could see the breakout of the linking domains. We could see the top file links to the site and we could see the page authority. So the Link Explorer report gives us an overview of what pages are linking to ours. And it also gives us an idea of what our own page authority and domain authority are. Because domain authority and page authority both need to be high in order for us to rank on Google search. And in order for it to get high, we need links from high quality sites. So that's the whole idea behind off-site engagement. So some of the offsite engagements are influencer marketing, meaning is there somebody out there on social who has a huge following? But not only do they have a huge following, but are they relevant to our product? For example, Usain Bolt, who's a famous sprinter. If we're selling shoes and we're selling Nike shoes, maybe Usain Bolt can reference us on Twitter or Facebook. That's influencer marketing, getting people to, influencing people to buy our product. We can engage with audiences on multiple social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter. Meaning if we're running a promotion on those running shoes, then we can promote that on Facebook. Okay. We can promote that on Twitter. We can also bookmark our webpage on popular bookmarking sites like StumbleUpon. We can also put our content on discussion forums like Reddit. We can join high PR quality Q&A sites, excuse me, and post answers to questions related to our business like Quora.com. So we can engage in sharing our content and answering questions. So there's lots of ways to get links to your website. If you have a blog post as an example, 
you can make sure that maybe that content is shared on a similar blog post. So if you have an ice cream recipe blog post, well, maybe you can look at a dessert blog post and share your content on that particular blog post and have a backlink pointing from that blog post to yours as an example. And you can reciprocate. So the whole idea of content is sharing the content, but at the same time of sharing it, you're producing backlinks and backlinks help domain authority. So not only do they help domain authority, but they improve the search rankings. So in Google's eyes, the higher your domain authority, higher the page authority. In Google's eyes, that means your page is important, it's credible, and we're going to improve it in the search engine rankings. It increases brand visibility. If we have our content on a highly engageable website, a highly popular website or a blog, it's not, it's going to lift our brand visibility. If we have Usain Bolt, who's a very famous sprinter, do some influence in marketing for us, then that's going to increase our brand visibility. So anytime we can associate with something that has some influence or some clout or high domain authority, then it's only going to increase our brand awareness and visibility. So again, it's going to increase our domain authority because of the association of passing link juice from one domain to another. It's going to then, as a result, increase referral traffic. Because if we're on a high quality website that gets a lot of traffic, then the chances of some of that traffic going to our site is gonna be great. And again, it improves the credibility and trust of our website, and that's what we want. We want Google to trust us. And a way to build trust is by associating our website with other websites of high, equal or higher quality. So when we talk about offsite engagement, we want to do some guest posts on relevant websites. So if you have that ice cream blog, go to another blog like the, the dessert blog and do a guest post. So not only that will that improve your brand awareness, but it'll generate a backlink and maybe drive some referral traffic. You can participate in forums and blog discussions like core.com or Reddit. Get your content out there. Start a discussion about a specific topic to engage users, build brand awareness, and generate that backlink. You can always, you know, put your your site on a directory like Yelp, for example, or Yahoo directory. You could prefer testimonial link building, meaning if you serve products or offer up a service, well, somebody could provide a testimony on their website. Or you could just earn backlinks from relevant authoritative web pages like we mentioned Quora or Wikipedia. Or, there's plenty out there. So the idea is to associate yourself with high quality websites, but do it naturally. You don't want to force anything. So if, if you're selling a specific service or you're selling a specific product, Look for like mining services or products that complement what you do. And that'll create the natural environment, natural ecosystem that will eventually give you the benefits that you need to rank higher in the search results pages. So we don't want to purchase any links. We don't want to cloak content. We don't want to just inject links on sites that aren't relevant. We don't want to just have site-wide links all over the place pointing to the same page. And we certainly don't want to be on low quality websites or directories. It's all about quality, not quantity with off-site engagement. So having off-site engagement complements what you do on your website for on-site. Together, both of those efforts will get you higher search engine results. So if if you are looking to become an SEO professional, then look no further than Simply Learn's postgraduate program in digital marketing. Gain in-depth knowledge of search engine optimization. With this course, you will also learn content marketing, web analytics, keyword management and research, website optimization, and much more. Unlock a whole toolbox of skills, including SE ranking, Hootsuite, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Google Ads, and Keyword Planner. Don't miss out on this opportunity. Find the course link in the description for more information. Is your website not ranking as you thought it would? Are there too many competitions out there? Is it getting difficult to capture relevant audiences? Are the solutions suggested too expensive? Do not worry. In this video, you will get easy solutions to all your questions. As we have come up with a list of top 10 SEO tools that anyone can use. And the best part is, 
you need not to spend a single penny on these tools. Yes, you heard it right. They are free of cost and are very useful for anyone who wants to start an online business or struggling to improve reach. So, let's jump right into the list. But before we do, kindly subscribe to our channel Simply Learn and hit the bell icon to never miss on such interesting and useful videos. To carry out best SEO practices, the first free tool on our list is the Keyword Planner. Keyword Planner is a free keyword research tool provided by Google. Proper keyword research is important as it increases the possibility to rank well on the search result pages. The Keyword Planner will help to discover new keywords, estimate monthly searches a keyword has, get the cost of ads for the keyword you are looking for, and help to organize keywords. Let's understand how to use Google Keyword Planner. Open your AdWords account. Now, go to the Tools section and select Keyword Planner. Now, you can either add a keyword to get new insights or upload a CSV file to get search volumes of already known keywords. Let's see how it works. Click on Discover New Keywords. From here, you can change the location. Enter the key phrase for which you need keyword insights. Click on Get Results. Here you can see all the keyword ideas related to your keyword phrase. Now, to get the search volumes of already known keywords, Go to the Keyword Planner and click on Get Search Volume and Forecast. Now, upload your CSV file from here. Here, you will get search volumes for all the keywords. Other similar tools with free trials include KeywordTool.io and Keyword Generator by RFs. To know trending ideas, you can use Google Trends, whereas to get title ideas, you can use the Answer the Public tool, which is free. Now, let's see the next tool in the bucket. Google Search Console Google Search Console is a free webmaster tool provided by Google. It is important to timely monitor your website and make it error-free. This is where Google Search Console comes into the picture. It helps businesses to monitor and maintain their website's presence in Google search results. Some features of Google Search Console includes getting confirmation that Google search engine can crawl your website, fix the problems in page indexing, sends pages for re-indexing, can view Google search traffic data, records the number of times your website appears in the search results. Records the search queries for which website appears in the search result. Shows the list of sites linking to you and many more. Let's now understand how to use Google Search Console. Here, the total impressions suggest that number of times your website appears in the Google search results. Whereas, the total clicks suggest that number of times your website is clicked from the Google search result page. From the coverage section, you will get to know all the errors occurred during the crawling. 
We recommend you to try your hands on tunes like Bing Webmaster Tool and RFs, which is free for website owners. Next up, we have the Yoast SEO plugin. Yoast SEO plugin helps in improving your search results ranking. It has a free as well as a paid version. As a beginner, you can quickly check the free version. It has an inbuilt feature that automatically carries out SEO analysis and readability analysis and automatically adds structured data. Let's take a quick look at SEO plugin. From here, you can add SEO title. From here, you can edit the slug. Slug is the part of URL. You can add the necessary keyword here. In the meta description section, you can add the meta description, which all together looks like this. Well, this part is your slug. The keyword you want to add in your page should be added in the focus key phrase section. The SEO analysis section shows the SEO improvements in your content. Now moving towards the readability analysis. Readability analysis shows improvement in the textual content of the page. If both the indicators are green, then your SEO and readability both are good to go. For Yoast SEO, we have covered the significant features and now we will understand one of the essential SEO tools, Google Analytics. Website tracking plays an important role in SEO. It helps in understanding the user behavior on your website. Google Analytics is an analytics tool used for tracking a website. The standard version of Google Analytics is free. We can integrate Google Analytics with Google Ads. The main features of Google Analytics include tracking session duration of users, pages per session, and tracking website traffic and bounce rate of users. Let's take a quick tour of Google Analytics. Here you can see reports of users for last seven days. Now go to the report section in the dashboard. You can reset the time span to get the desired data from here. Go to retention where you can see the number of new users and the number of returning users to your website. To know the data on monetization, Go to the monetization section. Here you can see the monetization data for the selected time span. We will understand Google Analytics features and how it works in the upcoming videos in detail. Moving ahead with the next tool, which is Small SEO Tools, Pulgarism Checker. Duplicate content is hated by search engines. If not taken seriously, this could hurt your search rankings. The plagiarism checker detects duplicate data in your content and shows its source. You need to open this plagiarism checker. Here, you can add your content manually.
After adding your content manually, you just need to undergo a verification and click on check plagiarism. And here we get the results. The content is 100% unique. In case if we get any duplicate content, we can check the sources from here. As our content is unique, we are not getting any results here. In case if you don't want to enter your content manually, you can upload the document file from here. Note that this checker checks for the top 1000 words of your content. So in case of lengthy content, you can break the content and then check for its uniqueness in case you don't want to purchase the pro version. Moreover, you can also add a page URL to check the uniqueness of the content the page has over here and follow the same process by clicking on the Check Plagiarism button. The Plagiarism Checker by Grammarly is also one of the free tools used for checking uniqueness in the content. The next tool that we have in our bucket is the Page Speed Insights. As per the data provided by Google, the bounce rate increases to 32% as the page load speed increases from 1 to 3 seconds. PageSpeed Insights is the PageSpeed Check tool. PageSpeed Insights is used to test the speed of a web page and it is a free service offered by Google developers. Results of PageSpeed Insights show what real users are experiencing about your page on mobile devices and desktops. To understand how to use it, let's go to PageSpeed Insights and select the URL of the website for which you want to undergo the check. Enter the URL and click on Analyze button. Now choose whether you wish to undergo a check for mobile or desktop device. Here, I'll select a desktop device. Just in few seconds, you will get the required results. Another tool that we can use is tools.pingdom.com which has free as well as paid versions. Moving forward to the next magic tool, which is SEM Rush. To grow your business, it is essential to keep an eye on what your competitors are doing. This will help you to understand their strengths and implement similar strategies for your business as well. For this, you need to carry out competitor analysis. SEM Rush is the competitor analysis tool that gives a complete walkthrough the competitor's data like keywords, backlinks, top performing content, campaigns, etc. It has free as well as paid versions. You can access free trials by simply signing up on semrush.com. So, let's take a quick overview of how it works. Log in to your SEM Rush account. Here, enter the URL of your competitor. Here, you can choose a geographical location for which the analysis is to be performed. By adding URL, you get all the competitor data. Here, I have added SEMrush as a competitor. So, we are getting 
so many details of SEM rush. The organic keywords, the organic traffic, paid keywords, paid traffic, referral domains, and authority score. We can add a competitor as well from here. Now here you can see the data of both SEM rush and RFs. Other than SEM rush, you can use Spyfu, which has some free daily trials. Now let me tell you about an excellent auditing tool, which is Screaming Frog. Dear learners, it is essential to know how your website is performing. And for this, you need to carry out frequent website audits. Screaming Frog is a website auditing tool that works similar to web crawlers. It has free as well as paid versions. Some features of free version include finding broken links, errors and redirects, analyzing page title and metadata, href lang attributes auditing, finding duplicate content, etc. with a crawl limit of 500 URLs. Let's know more about it. Go to Screaming Frog. Now, from here, download the tool on your system. Check various resources provided on how to learn the tool from here. Another alternative tool you can use for auditing is SEObility, where you can enter the URL and get the audit reports. Moving further with another free tool, which is RF's Backlink Checker. Gaining high quality backlinks is an essential factor for SEO ranking as it shows the trust of other websites in your content. Moreover, it helps in building the authority of your website. With the help of Backlink Checker, you get the data of all the websites linking to your website. RF's Backlink Checker shows the data of top 100 backlinks, top 5 anchors, and top 5 pages, including total number of backlinks and referring domains in its free version. Let's have a quick look at the tool. Here, let's take example of wikipedia.com. So here, we are checking backlinks for wikipedia.com. Now click on check backlink. Here, we got details of backlinks for wikipedia.com. Alternatives to RF's Backlink Checker are SEMrush Backlink Analytics Tool and SEObility. By signing up with these tools, you will get some free trials for your site. Last but not the least, let's know about the mobile SEO tool, which is Mobile Friendly Test. Studies show that in year 2020, 60% of traffic was through mobile devices. Thus. It is essential to keep your website mobile friendly as well.
here is when the mobile friendly test comes into action it helps to check if your website is mobile friendly or not go to mobile friendly test and enter the url of your website suppose i enter here www.wikipedia.com now click on test url Here you get the results. We can see that the page is mobile friendly. To check more details, you can navigate to your Search Console account. Well, if you think we are done for today, then 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 keep watching this video as we have two bonus tools for you. So here comes the first one, the Serperator. Search results vary with mobile devices. Also, your brand ranking may differ from country to country. To get reports on this, Serperator will be your all-time companion. It shows how search results may differ for mobile devices or locations. Let's see how it works. Go to Serperator. Now, let's fill in the required fields. Now, let's select the location. Let's run the live test. And here we get the results. That's it. Daily you can run three free live tests. Isn't this amazing? Without taking a minute, let's know about the second bonus tool, which is the rich results test. You must have seen these kinds of search results on search pages. Let's dive deep into it. Yes, these type of results are known as rich results. To check whether your site is optimized for rich results, go to rich results test and add the URL of your website. Let's add the URL of Simply Learn. Now click on test URL. Complete the verification and check the report. So here we can see that Simply Learn's website is eligible for Google searches rich results. To monitor rich results for your complete website, you can easily navigate to your Search Console account. 
Here we wrap up with basics of SEO. If you like this video, hit the like button and consider subscribing to our channel and hit the bell icon to never miss any updates from Simply Learn. Till then, keep watching, keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.